Yeah, this is the old beater right here. Yep. Now I gotta practice a little bit before I do it because I haven't <laughs> shot it since last year. <laughs> There's not much to it, you know, but yeah, don't fill me up. <laughs> <laughs> but when I'm out there, that's just how I go. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you got that, but that's, if you practice with these, a lot of guys will come down here to, to work it, shoot and come down to work it. If you practice, you can do it right, right from here and never lose it. You know, I, I I think it's really quick. Yep, that's nice. Practice. Yep. All right, so this week I sit down with legendary Adirondack tracker Joe Donito. He uh, is a wealth of knowledge, uh, one of the best trackers there is, and he does a great job explaining strategy uh, and articulating, um, you know, what's so special about tracking and how to consistently get on and kill. A mature buck, his average, I think, uh, as Jim Massett says, and he can uh, uh, attest to, six and a half year old, you know, bucks. He's killing old mature bucks in one of the hardest places in the country to do so, in the vast Adirondack wilderness. So, um, this is a really great podcast. Watch it all the way through, um, and you guys are going to enjoy it and learn a lot. And I just want to remind everybody, um, Joe Donito. Jim Massett, Steve Grabowski, their whole crew is going to be coming out to hunt stock. So um, you're going to want to come and say hello to those guys, catch a seminar, hang out with them, have uh, a bunch of great conversations. Um, after this podcast this week, we're going to be releasing a Living Legend series podcast with Jim Massett. He's 86 years old. He is, you know, kind of the Babe Ruth of tracking over there in the Adirondacks. Um, awesome, awesome guy as well. I'm looking forward to getting that podcast out. So the next couple of weeks, you guys are going to hear from the 80K trackers. If you haven't got your tickets to Huntstock yet, you can still do so. Just go to www.huntstockevents.com. It takes place in Westminster, Massachusetts. Uh, just a three-hour drive or so, a little bit more than that from uh, from where uh, Joe Donito and uh, the Adirondack boys live. So if you're out there, come on over. It's definitely worth, worth the three-hour drive. Um, we're giving away $30,000 worth of gear um, in door prizes. So every entry, you, you get a chance at winning gear at the end of each day. We're doing, I think, nine grand the first day, 10 grand the second day, 15 grand on Sunday uh, worth of door prizes from guns to bows to hunting trips to camo to wool hunting gear to all kinds of awesome stuff. Uh, more than 50 hours worth of seminars taking place on two stages. We've got our Onyx Hunt stage. Uh, inside the barn, we've got our Moultrie Mobile stage outside uh, in the main festival area under a wedding tent. We've got a White Duck Outdoor Classroom. There's all kinds of places, an awesome opportunity to learn how to become a better hunter, take in some knowledge from the legends of the hunting game on both the tracking side, bow hunting side. We've got a little bit of stuff for everybody. So the ADK trackers obviously doing seminars every day. We've got Lanny Benoit, Timmy Bulldog, Glenn Bombardier doing a tracking seminar every single day. Lanny Benoit, Jim Massett, Joe Donito, Hal Blood. I mean, if you're a tracker, you've got to come to this show. It's worth a three-hour drive from the Adirondacks. Again, it's in Westminster, Massachusetts at Wildwood Farm, August 11th, 12th, and 13th. Go to www.huntstockevents.com and get your tickets. We look forward to seeing you there. Let's get into this podcast now with Joe Donito. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Hunt Suburbia podcast. We're not in suburbia. We're out here in, uh, where are we at? Marcy, New York? Marcy, New York, yeah. With Joe Donito, legendary tracker. Yeah. <laughs> about that but in the adirondacks and uh, and elsewhere so for the people watching i interviewed jim massett yesterday yep awesome guy and uh he was you know he mentioned you quite a bit in in the podcast as a better hunter than him but you know that's his character yeah jim has always been a generous guy when it comes to that always 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 complimenting the other guys never taking the credit for himself and, uh, but he's, you know, he, he had a lot of great things to say about you and your hunting skills, but what he brought up over and over again was the fact that your average buck was something like six and a half years old. Is that, is that in the, uh, 
Yeah, I in would the say range. six, six and a half if you add them up together. Um, but it's just because those are the bucks I'm hunting. Um, if you become a tracker, which I am, you don't follow the smaller bucks. And it was Jim, me and Jim were actually together one time, and I was really young into it in my early 20s. And I shot a few of the, you know, the eight pointers with the 14 and 15 inch spreads, the three and a half year olds. And he had stated some of those guys, yeah, some yeah. of them with guys. And he had stated, you know, you're not going to shoot the bigger ones if you're tracking the smaller ones. And it goes all the way back to tree stand hunting, still hunting and whatnot. If you've got a tree stand that's got a six pointer that's going by it all the time and you sit in that tree stand, you're going to end up with that six pointer. Yep. Uh, you got to pick the tree stand there. It's the same with the track. If you're going to follow a track of a younger buck, you're going to end up with a younger buck. And it's one of the harder things to do as a tracker if you've gone a few hours looking for a track and you finally come across one that looks like a buck, you're pretty sure, and you follow him a little ways and he rubs a small tree, but he's not a big buck, hard to step off of that track and go yeah. look for another. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to end up with that 14-inch eight-pointer. So, you, you know, it was, a, it was a hard transition to, to pass up smaller buck tracks. So how do you, is there a way to, uh, in your opinion, like distinguish between, you know, a three and a half year old in the How are you getting to that six level age class? There's you know, the six year old. Yeah, it's a good question. And it, and it is, once you have a little more experience and everybody will get it if they try it, is it's, it's just size, really the size of the track. If I look down and I, it doesn't immediately impress me, and I don't say, holy cow, I know right away that's not a, not a track that I want. Now, everybody out there, and me included, knows that sometimes a smaller footprint could have a really good rack. But I'm going to go with the odds. The big track has a good rack. Yeah. You know, the smaller one might, but he might not. Um, there's a few, few different uh, ways to tell as well. Obviously, the size of the track, number one. Number two, if he's setting down deep in the back, as they get older, they get more flat-footed. So if you see more dew claws, yeah. and dew claws are deeper and they're bigger and they're more imprinted, you're looking at an older buck. And then sometimes the snow isn't real clear. It's, it's melted out a little or you've gotten snow since, you know, in the track. The stagger, the right to left, as they get older, their chests get bigger. The chest gets bigger, the left print's going to be farther away from the right if you draw a line down the middle. It's just a bigger, older buck going to have a better rack and that's how you're going to average six-year-old bucks you got to go after the older ones and you wait for uh snow i mean you're right. so you're you're farming full-time you're doing right. other stuff on the side um and you've got to really pick your days like you to, to hunt so you right. actually don't hunt too much do you no no i don't do trail cameras i don't hunt very much i don't scout um but i do hunt when it snows and saying that i want if you gave me two weeks and i could have pick any two weeks i want or you give me five days and i can pick the five days i'll take the five days every time rather than a two-week block two in week a row. block yeah because there's a chance in that two-week block it doesn't snow it might <clears throat> snow the day before it might snow the day after my two weeks mm -hmm. but i'll be there on the day i call them killing days any day there's snow it's a killing day now some are better than others there's no such thing as bad snow there's just better snow so, yeah, I, uh, I don't hunt a lot of days in a season, um, but I do hunt when it snows. When yeah. the snow does fly and you get those killing days, where do you, how do you know where to start for a track? Do you have places in mind that you've seen, you know there's a big buck that you didn't catch up with the year before, or you have a signpost or something like, you know, the guys in Maine and a lot of trackers will go look there to start for a track. Where, do you, where are you going when that snow hits? Well, after hunting for 30 years of doing it, I, you know, I obviously I have my spots that I'll go look, but I also love to see new ground. And I don't think there's a lot of difference on either one. All I do is look for big country that's away from the waters. By that, I mean the creeks, the beaver meadows, the rivers. I go high. You doesn't go high. It doesn't got to be peak high, but if get up on the ridges, check your maps, and go where there's not much water boundary. Um Many of my bucks are first-time hunts. First time I was in that area, the area happened to get the snow. Drove up, opened the map, seen it was a big wooded area that had uh, very little water to stop me, and went in for the track. You don't have to have scouted it. You don't have to know. If you travel and look for that track, you'll find it. You're avoiding the water because you don't want to 
yeah. have a barrier that you know you can't control, right? Right. Yeah. I can't cross it, but he can. Yeah. And that that'll obviously slow you down if you got to look for a place to cross. If you got to go back a mile or ahead a mile, or you might lose them all together. So I go higher just because of that reason. And if you look, there's a lot of mountains up there that you don't have to worry about water. Yeah. You know. So and that's what I look for. How many? Um, you know, you said you don't not necessarily have to go to the peaks, but do you go? Do you ever walk the top of the ridge lines? You know, on the peaks of any of these mountains. I do. One thing I do try to avoid, though, as far as the peaks go, a lot of times I'll go to the top, but I want a mountain that's long, a couple of miles long or longer. I don't want to waste all my energy getting up there yeah. to only go for five minutes and have to come back down. You uh-huh. just burned up a lot of what you've got, gas in the tank, so to speak, for the day. Mm-hmm. So I'll stay a little bit lower if I can go longer. Another tip is if, if you're going to go in there looking for one of those tracks, just go to 12, 1 o'clock away from your truck. After that, right or left is just as good and new as going away, and you're not getting farther from your truck. Can't tell you how many times if I didn't find a track by noon, I'll open up my map and I'll say, you know, that's far enough from the truck. And while I'm looking at my map, I'm looking to avoid water. One side seems like a lot more ridges. The other side seems like a lot more water. So I'll take the ridge side. No sense getting farther from the truck when it gets dark. Yeah. Just as new a ground. So you start swinging back a little bit. A little bit. But what happens if you get on a track there and he's not going towards the truck? Yeah, I go to dark. <laughs> yeah. I, I go to dark, at, <clears throat> excuse me, if it makes common sense. Yeah. You know. Let's talk about the, the differences maybe between here and somewhere like Maine where you do have a lot of logging roads and things like that. Well, I do like the Adirondacks for the part of the less logging roads because uh, when you're on a track in the Adirondacks, he's yours. Nobody's going to cut you off. I don't see other footprints. I don't see other vehicle tracks, nothing, because it's... There's no other way to get into that block. No other way to get in there. And there's miles and miles and miles of it. Maine, you know, they got some roads. You could be on a track for three or four hours, come up to a road, and someone else drove by and took the track. It's, you know, it it happens. It's a different part of the game Different part of the game, yep. And it's frustrating to me, especially since I'm not used to it. You know, I have hunted Maine some. I shot a nice buck a couple of years ago up there. Um, I don't usually go there unless they've got snow and we don't, or I'm tagged out and I have the opportunity to go. Um, but I do like the Adirondacks for that reason. Yeah. Um, but as far as whether you turn back before dark or not, yeah, depends a lot on the buck, what the buck's doing. And he'll tell you, if you jump them hard at four o'clock, head for the truck, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to get a shot at that buck. If you jump them hard at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock and you're going for that second chance at them, and it's getting toward dark. Stay with them if you still got a chance. I don't care how far you are from the truck. Yeah. Because think about it. The woods are the same at night as they are in the day. Yeah. If you know your direction out, you're going to be fine. You just can't see as well. You got a flashlight. Take your time. Head out of the woods. Yeah. You've got a friend, uh, um, you know, uh, in the city, used to the city life, right? And uh, you told him that, I think, right? And he, now he loves it. He loves being in the woods in the dark, yeah. doesn't he? I'm not sure he loves being in the woods in the dark, but it opens up a whole nother chapter of your chances of killing the buck. We wait all year yeah. to uh, to do this. I can't see leaving that track at 2.30 because you want to go back to the truck. I've waited all year for snow, finally have it, finally on that big track, and I'm either going to walk out in the daylight or I'm going to walk out in the dark, but I'm going to walk out the same path. You know, I might be a little bit deeper, but I got a shot at that buck still that I've waited all year for. Yeah. If it makes common sense that I got a chance at him, I don't turn around. And, you know, as a guy who primarily bow hunts, that last two hours of the day of daylight is such a great time of the day, too. I mean, right. they're going to be a little bit more active. You probably have a good chance of catching them on their feet a little more. Um, so it's like, yeah, you're giving up that really great part of the day. Right. It's probably not as crucial on the on the track, sure. But it is it is it is a common sense thing. Once again, if you've got a chance, I stick with it. I have jumped in the second time at three thirty. I know that buck's not going to settle back down, go back to what he was doing, and give me a shot before dark. I'll leave him. But I could be on my way back to the truck, cut another track, and go on him, yeah. thinking he might not be far. You know, I, it's all common sense. You got to just analyze whatever situation you're in. What's the latest track you picked up in a situation like that where you ended up ended up closing? You know, actually killing the buck. I've got a few. I got a more a lot more of them than I missed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but probably one, two o'clock. Yeah. You know, it would be about the latest. Um, it, because I'm 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 extremely uh, 
I analyze every track a lot. And I mean, I, I really want to know what the buck's going to do. So it takes me a couple hours on a track to really get into the buck's head and say, hey, you know, he, he's doing this, he's doing that, and now we got to kill him. Just walking behind him in the Adirondacks and think you're going to walk up and kill him doesn't work, at least for me. So I, I like to catch the track before one or two, but I have done it with that, but, you know. So they're, are they a little bit more skittish here than in other places sometimes i think so i think the adirondacks are uh, these bucks are are skittish because of the low deer population now i know maine's low deer population those bucks are tough to kill as well uh, i've hunted ontario i've hunted montana um, but the adirondacks with the low deer population it does not take much to spook these guys out and when they go they go hard yeah um in my mind after doing this this many years i think you have two chances the first time you jump them, if you don't get them on that one, that was probably your best. But the second jump is also really good because the first jump, he doesn't realize you're tracking him. Mm -hmm. It's just a bump into him. He got scared off. Does he even know what you are? Or does it sometimes just take a twig snap for them to be gone? And yeah, a twig snap, there? he heard you. The worst is, is <clears throat> if he smelled you. Yeah. Even if he's seen you, is not as bad as if he smelled you. But if you've got time in the day, to, uh, he settles back down. He doesn't know you're following him. He just thinks you came through the woods and bumped him. Now, if you mess up the second jump, now it's a whole new game. He's a whole new animal. Now he knows you're following him. Now he's going to be looking at his backtrack even harder. He's not going to forget you're there. He's become a different animal. After the second jump, if I don't have him, I'm still following him, but I'm looking for another track while yeah. I'm traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Because he becomes a different animal. No, his, his skill set now, knowing you're following him and coming, He's just become on high alert. Yeah. In yeah. in my experience. Yeah. He's heightened a little bit there. Yep. All of his senses. So when you're walking, you you know, you you like to get in the mindset and after a couple hours and you, you you figure some things out. What are some of those things that you're figuring out? Well, I've got a thing where I compare it to a man coming home from work. These bucks are only doing two things in that time of year. You know, they're 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 looking for does or they gotta feed a little to stay alive. That's it. It's all that's on their mind. Mm-hmm. So a buck is a lot like a guy coming home from work. When you, when you leave your job, you take the easiest path. When he's looking for a doe, he's taking the easiest path. He's just cutting timber. He just wants to make ground. He's moving real estate. He's just on the move looking for the does. If you get on a buck that's taking the easiest path through the woods, the straight line, just going, just go. Put your head down and travel. You've got to catch up. Now, when you get close to home, you get off the highway. You take a right or a left. That's the off ramp. That white tail buck, and all of these guys are shot carbon copies of each other. He's going to take a right or left that doesn't really make sense. You're looking down through the woods. This is the ridge he's following, and all of a sudden he bears to the left or bears to the right. You say, why did he do that? We've been going for a half a mile, mile, two miles, whatever it is. He's been going straight away, and he's taking them. That's the off ramp. That's like you getting off the highway. Once he goes off the off ramp, he's going to go through the development, just like you getting close to home. All of a sudden, he's going to weave left to right. It might be 20 yards, 30 yards, but he's going to start to pull that little bit of zigzag. That's you in the development. And then he pulls in the driveway, and he does just like most guys do when they go out from work. They go to the refrigerator. You walk in the house, you open the fridge. When he takes that first bite of mushroom on the back of that log, or that first nibble of that bud, you're in the kitchen. When you're in the kitchen... You better, you become a moving tree stand. Yeah. You slam on the brakes. You were going wide open back there, 55. You went 30 in the development. Now you are a moving, you're in the kitchen. What's the guy do after he eats? He hits the couch or the bed. So will he. So when you get to the kitchen, you just hope that he fed for 50, 75 yards. You haven't scared him yet. And you become a moving tree stand. Myself personally, as a moving tree stand, that's one step every minute, two minutes, maybe even three minutes. And wait. That's, you, uh, that for that sounds. It's it's extremely tough. Two minutes in the woods is such a long time. Yes, you know. And without seeing anything, and you're you're trying to catch up to this buck, and now you're stopped. But I guarantee you, if I took most hunters in the woods and I said, "There's a buck within 120 yards of here, sneak oh, yeah. back up and kill him," get, yeah, they would. Yeah, it's having that confidence that he's within 120 yards after you just went a mile and a half wide open. Yeah. Yeah, if you knew there was a buck within 120 yards, you're not going fast. You're not going fast. I don't even believe in the two- or three-step motion. And when I say take a step and wait, what you're doing when you're waiting is for him to make a mistake, him to flip an ear, stand up out of his bed, take a step, turn his rack. 
You're waiting to catch that movement. Yeah. And then you got them. And it is sometimes just a flick of an ear, a turn, one ear turning. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and if the next time you're in the woods, try this out. Take one, st- look down a, a laneway, 30, 40, 50 yards, and take one step. That laneway's gone and the next one's open. And it might be at a different angle, different where. Everything changes every step. And then you have to wait for him to make that mistake. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've tried to, to, to just walk up on him. doesn't work in the Adirondacks. Yeah. You can't do it. He's going to spot you. He's going to be gone. I think, personally, other than the wind, which you can't control, the one thing that gives you away more than anything is movement. Everybody who hunts has done a movement where they catch it. You know, stand up in your tree stand, pull your bow back, turn your head. They catch that movement. Yeah. Well, think about a person on their level. It's the movement. So my step is very slow, and I stay very still waiting for him to make the stink mistake. And back to your like kitchen analogy, right? Once, once the buck is in his kitchen, or we are, right. you know, if you were up there having coffee and um, your kitchen's normally at this time pretty pretty quiet, you know it's just you, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, banging around on your front door, you're going to be extremely at high alert. You know, yep. if someone's in your house, you know it. Yep. And, and, and they might already be on the couch or in the bed. So when you come up into that, you do have to do the one-step thing. But think about this. When you're in your kitchen, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. You're not going. And, and it happens, obviously, early in the year. He might take a couple of bites and get back on the highway. Well, that's no different than the guy stopping at the gas station and grabbing a hot dog. It happens, recognize it, and get right back on the highway with him. I would much rather jump the buck and not get him than never catch up. Mm-hmm. At least you were in the game. Yeah. And if it's early enough in the day, you've got that second jump. So, you know, uh, traveling fast when he's traveling fast is really important stopping and one stepping is the killing mode you got to get to but you got to catch up well and that really is the most fun part too i mean you once you get into that like that now it's a real like the game's on and it's it's heightened for you all your senses are heightened his are heightened you know yeah it's fun following the track and you know making way through the woods and seeing all that but that's really the the one percent of the time that you you got to live for that yeah and you know what it's it's probably the hardest one to learn and it's not so much of when is when is what I call it in the seminars. When do I go fast? When do I go slow? So I call it when is when. But w- when you're trying to catch up to this deer and you might even be sweated up a little bit, you're, you're in that go mode, you just want to get to him. And now you're going to go one step every couple of minutes. That's the hardest transition yeah. to get into. But if you keep in the back of your mind, when I scare him, it could be another couple of miles, maybe three or four. It might get dark. This is a one-shot deal you got to keep in your head. That'll make you slow down and really, really go slow. Worst case scenario, the buck has got out of his bed and he's already on the move again. And it took you an hour, an hour and 20 minutes to do that last 100 yards. And you realize he's going again. You're still in the game. Mm -hmm. You haven't scared him off. Still going. You're on him and you're good. You bump him hard. Man, it's tough. The next one's tough. It's so important to do that slow mode in the end. When you say that, uh, yeah, yeah, you told me yesterday, you alluded to it a little bit, but what was your first buck track in this one here? Yeah, first good one tracking yes. that yep. kind of flipped the switch for you. And you had mentioned earlier <clears throat> about what one that I caught the track late in the day and still did it, and he was probably the latest one. Now that you bring it up, it's your first it one. Story. It was yeah. my first one. What it was was it was late in the season, last weekend in the Adirondacks. I'd made a big swing looking for tracks, but in those days, I was in my early 20s. I think it was 22 or 23 when I killed that one. And I made a swing, but it was nothing like I do today. I didn't realize tracking is different than still hunting. I didn't realize the ground you needed to cover. I didn't realize that you weren't hunting a deer. You were hunting a track. There was a lot of different things. But I made the swing, and I was coming back toward the camp. It was probably 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, I was less than a mile from the camp at that point. Making, making my way back, and I came across his track where I had gone through earlier in the day. It wasn't there. So I started to follow him. I did not go 30 yards on his track, and he was in the kitchen. There he is feeding. Now, I know it wasn't there earlier. It's late in the season. They're not chasing the does as hard. They're not traveling as far, and I'm in the kitchen. So I started one-stepping him right away. Probably 20, 25 minutes, I'd only gone maybe another 20, 25 yards, and I believe he stood up out of his bed and took two bounds, stopped, and looked back. 
when he looked back, he was there was a tree between us. I knew he had stopped because I couldn't see him. Left or right was wide open, and he was gone. There, he, and he's gone. I said, he's right there. I took a step to my left to look. I couldn't see him. I took a step to my right, and he was looking right at me, and I shot. He took off, and I shot again, and obviously 100 yards later, I had him. But it was probably 4 in the afternoon, and I picked up the track, 3.30. So even even the, your first you know your first good track that you followed um, and kill, buck that you killed tracking was you had that instinct to go real slow once you were in that game. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, everybody's bumped enough deer walking around the woods, and you know how smart they are and how good they are. If you know he's close, you will. It's kind of like sitting in the tree stand, and you're looking around and whatnot, and then you see a deer or hear a twig, you yep. poise up, and you're really cautious. Yep. Same thing when you're on the track. When you know you're close. You move like a sloth. I always call it a sloth. You're going to be a sloth when that yep. happens. You know, Your, your yep. movements have to be so slight. You know, because yep. you don't want to blow it. Well, the other thing, too, is <clears throat> what is, and I do one step and I do it very slow. If you do three steps, he's going to pick that up. If you do one, he might. Did I see something? Yeah. No. Yeah, I'm not yeah, really right. sure. And then when he swings his head to look there, you got him. You know, it's just a another way to fine-tune the end game. Yep. You know. So. so when we were talking yesterday about that buck, you said it's funny. You know, that was the first one, but then – Almost all of these bucks were a carbon copy. It happens the same way. Yeah. So what do you mean by that? Well, what I had just said about the highway, <clears throat> you know, the, the development in the kitchen, Every not everyone, but 95% of my bucks are the same way. I'll get on the buck. You want to know right away, are you in the kitchen like the first one I killed, or are you on the highway? You're either in one or the other. If you're on the highway, you just got to catch up. Now, every one of them I found the track, if I wasn't in the kitchen, I went hard to catch up. Saw the development coming, the right or left, that doesn't make sense. Pretty soon he's taking a bite, and I'm just in stealth mode. Now well, I'm just Other stealth. times he's on a doe, too, right? Or a couple, he's chasing does, because that's the that was the other part of what is he doing, eating or right. he's chasing tail. So, But you know when he's on a doe, you're going to see their track. Right. But what is he doing there that might be different? Well, common sense will tell you if he's found the girl, he's not going anywhere. You know, he's going to be do you, you You like it when he's with a girl more than the, the bedroom, or what do you think? I got to tell you. Eight out of every ten bucks I kill are alone. They're rarely I, I like. There's I said, not many girls in the Adirondacks. No, That's there's why. not, and they're alone. There's a couple of reasons why. <clears throat> One, you know, I like to track late season, mostly because that's when the snow comes. Yeah. You know, and the buck is a different animal. Now, to me, the buck has three personalities throughout the season in New York. New York starts the third week in October, in the Adirondacks. That buck is catchable a day, two day old track. No problem. He's going to go away. He's going to lay some scrapes down, rub a few trees, but he's not quite crazy about the does. So if the if the track was made yesterday, you found it today, you probably can catch him if you go hard. From the 5th, 6th of November to the 20th of November, he's a different machine. This is when they lose all that weight. Yeah. They go all day. They don't feed a lot. That's a tough time for the tracker. If you get lucky and he's with a doe, probably going to catch him. I've picked up a track at 7 in the morning on November 12th, 11th or 12th, went for seven miles on him, and I left him, and I think I was farther behind him when I left him than when I started with him because <laughs> he was making more time than I was yeah. during the night. They're just a traveling machine, and they're looking for that doe. They might've, he might have went through two doe groups and never found a hot doe and just kept going. Think about it. Everybody knows these bucks will pull 20 25% of their body weight within a few weeks. They've got to be exercising all day long. Yeah. So that's really tough. That's the second personality of that buck. Now, the third one comes after the 21st, 22nd, 23rd to the end of the season, which is the first Sunday in December. Now he's gone back to, I'm going to travel looking for the does, but instinctively, you know, the, the drive has gone yeah. down to procreate, to, to, to breed these does. And he is going to turn into... He's going to take opportunistic, probably, a does if he can. He has but. to, but he also is going to have to put some weight back on. He yep. knows to survive the winter, nature, you got to put some weight on. So yep. he's going to be in the kitchen more. That buck is catchable on a two-day-old track, especially toward the last weekend. Yep. He'll feed, he'll travel, he'll feed, he'll travel, he'll feed, he'll travel, as opposed to the 11th of November where he'll take a bite of that hot dog on the highway and just keep right on going. They're a tough animal during that time. So most of my bucks are toward the end of the season. Do you find uh, is there what, what's the what's your thoughts on the second rut in the Adirondacks? Of some of the you know places I hunt, these the yearlings are coming into heat. 
you know, mid December sometimes and it kicks back in and they're right back on their feet in that mode for a couple of weeks. It seems like, do you right. see that here? Or is it different? I think it does happen. <clears throat> I don't pay any attention. You know, I'm not a rut fan. The only thing I like is that later on they're, they're slower, they're tired and they want to feed. Yep. If the second rut hits, doesn't hit. If they're doesn't chasing matter. it, does not matter. Doesn't come into play. Actually, all three of the personalities don't matter to me other than I've got it in the back of my head mm-hmm. in the middle of November, you're going to have a hard time catching them go hard. But snow is all that matters. Some of these bucks were killed in October, and some of them were killed in December. The snow is all I care about. Yeah. You know, I don't change how I hunt other than trying to catch them a little harder in the middle on any of the bucks. They're all the same. So that one over there, um, that was an early – it was an October snow. Which one is the uh, – that line. one there? Oh, that one. Yep, yep. yep. Um, we'll put that in. I, I took some B-roll, so we'll put that in as we're talking about them. But when I walked in, I noticed he had – Kind of an earlier season coat. You know, he's not as thick as these winter guys. And uh, right. you were like, yeah, we got an early snow. So why don't we tell that story a little bit? I'll tell you, that <clears throat> that story kind of puts everything, all these bucks together into one story of what I do. Um, it was opening weekend of the Northern Tier. So it was around October 23rd, 22nd, somewhere in there, 21st. And I had no uh, indication that I was going to hunt for a few weeks. And there was no snow in my forecast. Yep. I didn't see any. And I was watching the 11 o'clock news, and it came across that they had a winter storm advisory for Warren Hamil- Hamilton County in the Adirondacks. I said, winter storm warning? Well, back then I got on the computer and looked, and some lady had blogged in that she had four inches of snow on the ground already. So at 11.30 at night, I'm putting my gear together. Yeah. I says, it's hunting season, there's snow on the ground, I'm going. Sunday morning, I woke up. You, that's the other thing about tracking. You don't got to be there an hour before daylight or anything like that. Hit the woods just after daylight, you're fine. An hour after daylight, you're fine. I drove up to um, Inlet, New York. No snow. I, and I walked into the nice and easy there, the gas station. I knew they had maps. I bought a map. I opened it up. I go, where's this Warren in Hamilton County line anyway? <laughs> yeah. And I realized I was 30 minutes short of it. Jumped back in my truck, drove 30 minutes up the road, and they were plowing the roads. There was five inches of wet snow on the ground. Nice. Pulled off the side of the road. I opened the map up, and I looked at this big ridge to my right. I looked to my left. I looked ahead all over on the map, and I said, you know what? I'm going to head into that ridge. I'm heading into there. There was a trail that went in for two miles. It was a nice long ridge like you're talking about, yeah, too? See, yeah, it, it was a seven-mile ridge. Nice. And I said, that's just, I'm just going to head in there. I go, I'm going to enjoy my day, see what happens. I walked it two miles in. Heavy snow, a lot of branches down. It never caught a deer track, not even a doe track. I said, well, it did snow during the night. They're probably locked down right now. Just look for a track, but don't get nervous that, you know, you haven't found one yet. Got to the end of the trail, probably 11 o'clock. said, I'm going to go up on the ridge and just hunt the ridge down. I got a couple hours more before I make a swing. Head up on the ridge. Yep. As I'm going up the ridge, I, to, in the first saddle, I jumped a bunch of deer. Running tracks left, right, this way. And I, I, I couldn't tell big, small, whatever, because they're running. I backed up a little and just swung around that area. And I saw it was does and fawns that had come up there and bedded. Nothing that I wanted. I left that group and just headed down the ridge. And I came across this solo track. And now, mind you, it's warming up. So it's like raining in the woods because the snow is all melting out of the trees. And I couldn't get the size of the print. It was so... Uh, distorted from the rain coming, yep. but the stagger was impressive. Left to right, this was a big chested deer. The print looked like it should be big, but it was was you couldn't identify it because of the rain. I uh, I started following him. I said, "This is a big buck. In an early season, I can catch him. It can't be that old. It only snowed last night. All these things are going through your mind, common sense wise." Yeah. I probably went forty five minutes on the highway just trying to catch up to him. He's just taking the easiest path. He's got no reason to stop. He all of a sudden veered up, which didn't make sense. We're going down the ridge. Why are you going up? You're, you're cutting ground, and now you're slowing yourself down. So he went from 55 to 30. He's slowing himself down. So you're kind of on like a shelf, not at the top of the ridge, but you're on the side of the shelf, and he's right. going back up all of a sudden? It's, well, it was, it was on the side hill. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, I, I'm a quarter of the way from the top of this ridge. Yep. And uh, he's just making ground, and all of a sudden he he headed toward the top. Mm -hmm. So it made me pause. I'm going slower. I'm not in that stealth mode yet, but I am going slower. got my head up. And uh, 
all of a sudden, I, I see a track ahead of me, 10 yards or so, that's I'm going to identify when I get to it. I ease up to it, and I look down, and it is the biggest, most beautiful buck track with zero melt in it. This thing is brand now, new. Now, all of a sudden, you see it I, in I glory. I <laughs> snap up, and I go, if I didn't scare this deer, we're right together right now. Yeah. You know, I'm in... I'm in the kitchen. I'm in the house. Yeah. And I, if my first thought was, there's two of them in here. And then it, it dawned on me, no, I'm in the Adirondacks. There's not two big <laughs> bucks this close. That's rare. So I said, this is the same buck. And sure enough, from that spot, I followed the tracks with my eyes, and I could see 20 yards over where he bedded, hooked around, got up, and went across his track. Now think about this. If a guy comes home, he sits on the couch for a little bit, or he goes to bed, he gets up, he eats again, and lays down again. Mm -hmm. Those are the killable bucks for sure, because yeah. you know he's right there. If he gets out of that bed and starts feeding again, he's going to lay back down. He's comfortable there. He's comfortable there. He's just stretching out, you know, getting a little more to eat, and he's going to lay back down. So I'm on this track, and I'm one-stepping him. One step. Wait a minute, two minutes, three minutes. Again, what are you waiting for? You're waiting for him to make a mistake. I eased up maybe 30 yards to my left, and it, the, the terrain kind of hid everything after that, so I'm coming up blind. Obviously, if he's just over it, he can't see me. I can't see him. As I got up to that little bit of next shelf peak in the woods, I'm walking almost sideways because that's another trick that I use. If you're walking straight ahead, the buck's straight ahead of you, you got a nice shot. The buck's to your left of you, you got a nice shot. But you got a very hard shot to your right. Yeah, you got to swing. So what I do is I walk sideways. And then the can shot you, is can straight. You show, can yeah, you show that real fast? I, sure. Yeah. My steps when I'm looking for him is like this. I can view here, here, and here. And he's very rarely straight ahead. So I'm standing, surveying, waiting for him to make the mistake. Mm -hmm. But I can shoot here, here, and here very easy. Mm -hmm. If I'm facing this way, I can't shoot yeah. over here. That takes a lot. Yeah. So I've just naturally, when I take my steps, I'm sideways. Point your left shoulder towards where towards you're Towards where you're going, going. Uh, if you're a right-handed shooter. Yeah. Sure. And <clears throat> this particular buck, I had taken a step, and I said, I know you're right here. And it, if I told you how many times I say that when I'm on a buck, you would if I had a dollar for every time, <laughs> I just keep saying to myself, you're right here. I know Yep. I know you're right here. Yep. And I took one of those steps and veered to my left, and I saw a patch of brown 14 yards away. 14 and I yards said, there. that's him. As I said that, his head turned. He was looking away from me. It looked like a rocking chair. And I shot him in his bed. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why I like telling that story is because I'd never been on that road before. I'd never hunted those woods before. I just went in to find a track. You weren't expecting to hunt for a few weeks. It right. was all just... There was no scouting, no trail cameras, no anything. This buck was nine and a half years old. He weighed 191 pounds, and he scored 134. A huge and all around for the Adirondacks, everything. Great buck for the Adirondacks. Old buck, good weight, good horns, everything. And I'd never been there before. Yep. I don't can't afford the time... To, to do all the scouting and whatnot. So to be productive at six and a half year old bucks in the Adirondacks, it's the if you show me a way I can do it better, I'll change how I hunt. Yeah. This is the most productive way for me. Yep. You know? And nowhere else had snow. So you can trail camera up and you can scout up and all and whatnot, but if an hour away from there gets the snow, you know, your all your scouting is not gonna help. And you. even even with that, you know, you're chasing snow. It wasn't there's not a whole a whole bunch of trackers didn't I'm sure there were, few, there were a few other trackers somewhere nearby within a few miles, you know, because they're chasing that. That was the area that the snow got, right? There had to right. have been other people, but it's so I vast that. Yeah, it, it's so vast, so much ground. Occasionally, I'll see another guy's track, and it's usually on the trail. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very rare. I was the only guy that parked there that was an old uh, camping. It's a summer campground. The only truck there that day. The only one in the woods, as far as I knew. Yep. You know, it just there's and there's I in a kind of a side note on that. Um, there's an eight pointer uh, below that buck, the wide one there. Yep. Um, I hadn't gone back to that area for three years. The 05 was that ten pointer we we're just talking about. In 08, we had a storm come through for Halloween, and it dumped 20 inches in a lot of the areas I hunt. But on that ridge was six inches. 
parked my truck in the same spot, but went on the other side of the road and shot that buck. So I'd parked on that road two days and shot two big bucks. That's awesome. Yeah. You and I back? haven't been back since. Well, Come I did on. hunt it once or twice since, I got to yeah. be honest. And didn't have the luck I did <laughs> yeah. then. But, you know. Why'd you go on the other side of the road that day? Um, Just for a new area. Yeah. Just, See something new. Yeah. You know, there was no... there's. One of the things people got to understand, if, if you're going to find a big buck track, you'll find it. But know that you're going to look for a track. Another mistake I made as a younger tracker, I would go into the woods, and you get in there an hour or so. Don't work yourself into a big sweater. It's just a nice, easy walk, whatever you're comfortable with. And you'd come to a ridge that was perfect. You know, you, got, you know it's swampy down below, and there's a couple of new rubs, a few deer tracks of does, and you think, wow, this is a great place to see a deer. And you start looking for deer. And you're going easy and whatnot. Now you've switched from a tracker to a still hunter. Know that. That's not a tracker anymore. Tracker doesn't have to sneak up on a track. You don't care. I don't care how many deer I scare. I don't care how many bucks I scare. I don't care what I do when I'm looking for a track. I'm just traveling. You got to get to the track. You got to get to the track while you have time. And if you start still hunting, and if you start following other deer tracks, you're going to end up looking for those does, looking for that small buck. You're slowing yourself down. Yeah. And you're going to come back to your truck a lot of times saying I couldn't find a big buck track. Yeah. Well, you didn't really look. You know, you 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 still hunted. Yeah. You didn't look. You know, you just got to keep moving. That is a hard thing, too, because I, I haven't done much track, and I um, I don't get a lot of snow where I'm at in Massachusetts, and there's right. a lot of big patches of woods driving distance. But I was telling you, I've got a few that if there is snow, I like to go and give it a shot. So I've put on maybe three or four days of track in, in the last few years, and it is. I know what you're talking about. When you get in there and – I'm so used to being a bow hunter, still hunter, type hunter that I get into a place, this looks very, there's big buck sign, bunch of rubs there, nice scrapes. Sure. I, I slow right down because yeah. to me, I, I don't have that. I need to try. I need to kill one track. And I need to. I like to hunt all different ways, mm -hmm. but uh, that would be, I could see uh, um, something if I wanted to get out and track and it's in my mind to track that day, you have to flip that switch yeah. off. You got to blow right through that area and not worry about it. Yeah. The chances of me still hunting up on a six year old buck in the Adirondacks and killing him is so slim. And yet, the eight out of every 10 days that I hunt, I'm within 200 yards of a six year old buck, but not still hunting. Yep. You're on the track and you're getting close. Yep. Still hunting one, bumping into one once every 10 years. You know, or, you know if you hunt a real lot, you know, you're going to get a shot at one maybe once a year. Uh, just by chance happening, I'm not going with those odds. Yep. I'm going with the odds I got to find that track because then I know I'm going to get close. I know I'm going to get within 200 yards of them. And then some people think I'm a lucky hunter. I've been called lucky. Oh, you're lucky. You're lucky. I don't agree with that. I agree that I put myself in position to get lucky. All the work goes into getting there. And do you need a little luck in the end? Sure you do. You need the wind to be blowing in your direction and not his. You need to come up there as quiet as you can. He need where he didn't take that bite and lay right down. So he's laying right in the kitchen. Yep. You kind of want him to feed for 75 yards or so and then lay down. You want him to give you some indications. All a little bit of luck of that day. But get yourself in position to get lucky. Yeah. And you, uh, you know, it's um, you've probably heard too. Oh, if I had enough as much time as that guy does to hunt, I could, uh, yeah. I could do it. You yeah. know, like uh, you hear everybody hears that. Yeah, I can remember shortly a while back, I was talking with Jim Massett, and this might have been ten years ago. And he he told me add up a bunch of your last bucks and tell me how many days. Why not seven out of eleven when we put it together were on the first day I hunted. So yeah, you don't need. Three to five days a season sometimes is all the snow we got. I have had seasons where I'd hunt 10 or 11 days, pretty rare. Um, in 2019, had my best season ever, and I missed five bucks. But the re it, it, Your best season, you didn't kill a buck. Best season, and I didn't <laughs> kill a buck. In, in it, i got to give you the reason. It doesn't really make sense in a way. And Obviously, if I'd have killed the last buck was on the last day that I missed, would have been the top season for, you know, I'll never top that. But I was able to keep hunting. And we had some snow. But what it did for me, it just put a stamp of approval on what I do. I'd miss a buck on Monday, maybe not see anything on Tuesday. Wednesday, I missed another one. Okay, two bucks, but it worked both times. Two more days later, we got snow again. On Saturday, I'm hunting again, and I miss another buck. Well, this really must work. Now there's three within the week. And you got to look at all these bucks, didn't you? 
Oh yeah, I'm they're all good bucks. Guys. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not tracking. These are big Adirondack <laughs> bucks, you know. Yeah. And, and my confidence level for sneaking up on them is just growing because it's working. And I've been doing it for 30 years. But if you tag out and it's over, th- this is three seasons in a row because I'd missed three times in a row. Then you get to the fourth one and you're like, man, this is great. I mean, you know, this <laughs> I, I get action. to keep doing action. <laughs> Put it into a tree stand. If you had a tree stand and you missed a really good buck on Monday and you go back in the tree stand on Thursday and you miss another good one, on Sunday, here comes another one. And you different miss ones. Him. <laughs> yeah, all different bucks. And then on the following Tuesday, you miss it. You'd think that tree stand was sent from heaven above. Yeah, That's but the a greatest tree stand in the world. hunter might want to give up at that point. They'd... <laughs> yeah, he might, yeah. Well, you know, I was losing confidence in my shooting ability for sure, but yeah. they weren't easy shots. Some of the bucks I'm shooting at, guys would never even get the shot off if they don't practice quick shooting. Yep. So, yeah, I missed, but it's not a standing buck that I had time to yeah. shoot at. You know, these yeah. guys are on the move and – you know, they busted me for some reason. I got two shots at him running away. Should have killed him, but, you know, but but they weren't easy shots. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, but what a great season. What a great way to say, hey, this works. You know, it, it's not lucky every year. I did it over and over and over again in one season. What about tell that fifth buck? Because that was, uh, you know. Uh, the fifth buck was just a mess up. Uh, I think it's hell blood that calls it the analysis paralysis. I, I had I'd lost all my confidence in my shooting ability. Um I happened to be hunting with Hal, and he had he had brought me to a track. He was tagged out, and he said, "Hey, if I got to go." This was here in the Adirondacks. This was so, in the yeah. Adirondacks. He comes down and hunts with me sometimes, and I go to hunt with him, uh, not together, but out of the same camp. And uh, I got on the buck, and I was going, and it was starting to rain. It was the last day of the season, and we had four inches of snow, a little bit of fog setting in, and the buck was feeding right along. You know, I I'd only gone a half a mile on the highway as i call it he took a swing on this ridge and he started feeding and that late in the season they're going to feed heavy this buck's going to feed for a while um i had an open sight i do take two different rifles i've got one with a scope and one with an open sight in your car with you yeah all the time um if it's clear out and no snow in the trees i'll take the scope but if there's snow in the trees it's raining or snowing i'm a peep sight guy I don't clean the scope during the day. I don't like to do it. I think it's a hassle, and I'm just as good with the peep sight. Now we got rain, fog. I got the peep sight. Um, spotted the deer at about 80 yards, I think, 70, 80 yards. Nice open ridge. Uh, he's, you know, he's moving along, and I, I can tell it's a deer. Now I see the horns, trying to line up the sight. And every time I put the bead on him, it seemed like it covered the whole deer. Yeah. Um, finally, I got impatient. My confidence isn't good, but I got that bead covering the whole deer. I'm going to send one in there. If I get them hit, I'll get them. You know, I, I never left a wounded buck in the Adirondacks. I hope to never do it, knock on wood. Anyway, uh, I shoot. The deer jumps sideways and, and, and hesitates for a second as I'm working the action, and I realize I've missed. And all of a sudden, he just bolts out of there. I never got a second shot off. But I knew because he didn't bolt when, the shell, you know, when I shot, he was missed. I looked at my watch. It was 10 after 12, and I thought, what a hell of a season. Yeah. Five big bucks in, you know, in less than 12 days or whatever it was. It was just phenomenal. And I was actually pretty calm. I said, you know, I missed them, but what a great year. Yeah. And then I said, you know, I still got a shot at him. I'm going to go get this buck. I don't know why I thought it was over when I missed, but I just thought it was. And away I went. For some reason that morning, I put on my binoculars that I take out west. I never carry binoculars. Some guys swear by them. I'm just not that guy. And I got 12 power binoculars on. I just, I don't know why I've got them, but I do. And uh, I went for about three, three and a half hours on the highway. He ran down the ridge, up over the next one, down the next one. Now he's walking and he's looking for does. He's on the move. He's, he knows he's not in feed mode. It was probably 3.30, 20 to 4 when he started to slow down and do a little left to right. I said, oh, here we go. I got a chance. This is going to happen. Um, How Did you wait or did you go right after him? I didn't wait too awful long because I knew he was scared hard and he was going to cover was a lot of It last day and it was 12 already. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> the trick of the wait, and obviously a lot of the trackers talk about it, the trick of the wait is if the buck runs three, 400 yards, he's not scared too bad, he's going to stop and look back. You don't want him to spot you then yeah. because now you've blown it. It's no longer a bump in. Now he knows he's going to get trailed and he's a much harder killed buck. You want him to go back about his business. So one of the tricks I use if I'm if anybody's too impatient for the wait, track the running track. In other words, start right after him, but go very slow even though he's running. Mm-hmm. It's going to take you 15, 20 minutes to get to where he stopped running. 
and hopefully he's already on his way. Yeah. Waiting 15 to 20 minutes is better, even a half an hour. Yeah. But late in the day, you don't you don't want to waste a lot of time. So go on him, go easy. Um, this buck never stopped to look back, maybe once, but he was he just was on his feet and he wanted to go. Um, probably around 3:30, quarter to four, he's mannered. Now he's starting to feed, and I am excited. I said, he doesn't know I'm coming after him. He thinks that last shot was thunder. He, I don't know if he thinks he got shot at, but he doesn't care anymore. It's been three and a half, four hours. I'm in the game. Yeah. We're, we're heading in the kitchen. Everything's about to happen. I came up over a nice little ridge. I'm looking down the other side, and I spot the buck, 70 yards, broadside, in the horns. Now, it's raining, so the horns are shiny as they get in the rain. They're yellow. They look too big for the body. I know this is a good one. This is one of those, just a really good rack buck. I throw the gun up, and now normally, for the last 30 years, I shoot as quick as I can. Yep. I don't hesitate. I put it on brown, I let it ride. My confidence is shot. I'm shaking because, you know, with, with lack of confidence, I'm, my, I'm not shaking, but I'm, I'm, my whole confidence has been shook up. And as I look down the side, I say, oh, wait a minute. Let me make sure which way he's standing. So I pull out my binoculars. This is where all everything falls apart. This is where the analysis paralysis hits. <laughs> Everything's going to go backwards from here. I can't find the deer in the binoculars because everything is so zoomed in. With If you're going to take binoculars in the Aeronics, make sure they're only 8 power. These are 12 power. Zooming in way too much. I cannot find this buck in these binoculars. And this is something you never do, so you're already throwing a wrench into your process. Right. I'm that... not even good with the binoculars. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I don't practice them. It's okay out west, but you're looking 7, 800 yards. Yeah. I'm trying to look 60, 70, and he's in some green as he's going through. It's not open. You know, don't think it's like in a field. Yeah. I'm trying to pick this deer out of, you know, where he's going, and he's he was walking to the left. He was cutting across, and he's, he was going very slow, and I've lost him. I can't find him. Now, every part around this bit of green that he's going into is open hardwood. I know he's still there. Yeah. I'm very confident that he's in there. Now, all i got to do is find him, spot him, and shoot him. And I also remember thinking the wind is blowing at me. I could feel the wind on my face. The rain hit me in my face. I'm, I'm in good position. I know I'm going to kill this buck. I'm 100% sure this buck's <laughs> going to die. I can't find him, can't find him, can't find him. I take a couple of steps. I'm looking hard for him, and something catches out of the corner of my eye. I look to my right, and he's taken his second bound over a hill. He's gone. And I said, what just happened? While I was looking through those binoculars, he switched directions. He walked in the open hardwoods away from me, and I never saw him with those binoculars. I'll never carry binoculars again, <laughs> unless my eyesight goes back, or at least go down to eight hours, get a lot better at them. But the buck left. It's four o'clock. He got scared right then. He either saw me, the wind shifted, something made him spook, and he was gone. I tracked him till dark, which was totally useless. He never <laughs> yeah. slowed down. Yeah. I mean, he went from a run to a walk, to a trot to a walk, but he never slowed down. It was dark when I got to the road, and he had crossed an old logging road up in there. And I said, "It's over." season's over what was your main what was the main thing you learned that season be confident in your shooting no matter what yeah and the other thing is i'll never you know try to pick if i got i shoot right away i am so uh acutely aware that these bucks can run at any split second and i know i can track him down and finish him off if if the shot wasn't as good as i thought it should be that i'll never hesitate again i'll just take that shot you know that 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 was my main lesson from there um, I'm also a believer. I, I, I messed up a buck on a buck in my early twenties that I was picking openings and waiting for the buck to run into the opening to shoot. Mm -hmm. I picked three openings. This buck come out of his bed at 30 yards. It was a great stock. Everything was great about the hunt. Huge buck. I picked an opening. He didn't show up, picked an opening, picked an opening and the deer was gone. I never pulled the trigger from that day forward. I shoot at the deer. I don't shoot, wait for the openings. I see Brown. I shoot. Yep. And now, after the 2019 season, I don't shoot at the deer. I shoot in the deer. That's my mindset. <laughs> don't shoot at him. Shoot in him. <laughs> because I had missed so much. I was shooting at him, but I wasn't shooting in him. So it's just a, you know, and then I, I, uh, I also don't believe in, and I know a lot of guys talk about this, but when you're getting ready with your rifle and you set it on the bench and you can cover your shots with a half dollar at 100 yards and you're close to the bullseye, that only proves one thing, that your rifle's ready. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. You are not. 
you will you will multiply your chances tenfold if you put up a lacrosse shoebox at 60 yards and pull up your rifle and shoot it four times as fast as you can. Yep. And if you hit it all four times, you weren't shooting as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. Speed up the shots till you're missing the target. A couple of them, yeah. Yeah, so you're missing it. Now start to aim. Your, your first job is to shoot fast. Your second job then is to get good at it. Hmm. So anybody who pulls up and shoots at that box and takes 10 seconds between the shots. That's not the scenario hand, you're going to get. That's not yeah. the scenario you're going to get. You're going to get three shots. You're going to get two shots. Or you're going to get one shot. I believe in the three shots. Um, my dad always used to say that uh, one good shot is better than four poor ones. I go, yeah, but my good, my one good one is my fourth one. <laughs> so I got to get rid of the first three. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just, and, and you'd be amazed within a short amount of time if you go through two or three clips through your gun, by the fifth clip, you are such a better shot. Your, your muscle memory, your, your gun, how it feels, how quickly you come up to your shoulder. It's amazing how quick you can get good at it. It's not like golf. Golf takes forever. Yeah. You can get to be a good shot offhand fairly quick. It becomes an extension of your arm, and it's instinctual once yeah. it gets to that point, right? Yeah. It also will point out <clears throat> any flaws. If you've got your hunting coat on and you pull up and shoot really quick and it catches on your coat or your gun's not working right, the action doesn't feel right, the scope's... Any flaw you've got, I've had it jam, I've had the clip not go in, I've had a lot of different scenarios when I'm trying to shoot those four or five fast ones. You know, and it, 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 If you empty the gun, take your shell out, put your one shell in, close it up, and then shoot, you don't know how your gun's going to react when you're slamming that bolt or slamming that pump yeah. or letting the automatic run. You got to let her go. Yeah. You know, you, you, it's a great way to practice. What gun do you use? What's your well, go-to? I've got a 760 carbine pump. That's my peep sight gun. But I also have a Browning Micro Medallion 7 millimeter 08 with a, with a very low-powered 1 to 4 Leopold scope on it. That gun's very light, carries very well. Um, I've got a bit of a messed up right arm in my hand. My thumb sets right on the safe on that gun because the safe is on the top of the Brownings. It's just a great, great little gun. I do believe the right gun for anybody is the gun that they like, that fits them, that they use. But shoot, try to do a light one. Even Jim's super heavy. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, if, if you love your gun, you love your gun. But I can tell you this, if you put a scope on that 760, it's about a pound heavier than that micro medallion. And yeah. at the end of the day, you recognize that pound. Yeah. You know, it, it is it's definitely the lighter the gun, the better. Is the yeah. What's the action in the micro medallion? I'm not, it's a bolt action. Yeah. And... Through shooting, you, you can never get good at fast shooting with a bold action if you only shoot it off the bench. Yeah. But you'd be surprised how that's, fast. That's third in line for most people. It's yes. Bolt. It's bolt. And I never drop it off my shoulder. When <clears throat> I pull the trigger, I work the bolt. A lot of people will drop the gun down and work the bolt. Mine doesn't. I, I have the gun right at my shoulder. I work it. and. Can you demonstrate that right real back quick? At, Do you actually, have one that here? one's in the safe. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yep. I can. You got about forty guns on the floor. Well, after we'll we'll do some quick. Uh, yeah, if you want to do you that, quick. we can yeah. do that, and I'll, yep. I'll bring the camera up and. Sure. Yeah, because in in the only way I learned to do that is shooting at that shoebox. You don't need your buddies when you're doing this. You don't need other people there. You don't. You, you just need a couple boxes of shells, and then someone obviously in this audience is going, to go, "You know how expensive shells are." Yeah. Listen, let's not add up how expensive venison is by the pound. <laughs> yeah. You know, let's not go there. Uh, don't give any your our wives any. Uh, yeah, you know. indication of what's going on. But okay, so you go. But out I'm looking at shell boxes of shells yeah. up there that are old. that are eleven dollars. You don't find that now. You don't find that now. <laughs> no. But if, if you if you do uh, go through a couple of boxes of shells, and even if they're fifty dollars a box, a couple hundred bucks, you go through all of that, you will be amazed at how much more prepared you are for that shot mm-hmm. when it comes. If you just go through those couple boxes of shells before the season. You know, and, and round them out at a shoebox. Don't worry about where you're hitting the shoebox. And there's some stuff you can do too, just working in the action and get. You don't need to pull the trigger every time. There are things you, you could do, right? That... Right. But <clears throat> there's no. You still have to go shoot at that shoebox yep. to really get. So you can work your action fast. You know, I can almost shoot as fast with my bolt action as I can with the pump. Hmm. You know, and it. I, I don't feel. I feel sorry for the gun because I do <laughs> ratchet it hard. Yeah. You know, but yeah. Yeah. Yep. And another thing is, I know myself included, some guys might have that natural ability. I do not. I have to do it every year. Every year. 
I am not a good shot at all, and my confidence is very low if I don't have the time to go and practice a little bit. It doesn't take long, but sometimes we get busy, and next thing you know, it snows, and I'm in the woods, and I'm, I don't have the confidence. Middle season, I'll go and do it. Yep. You know, and, uh, you know, it's like anything else, uh, golf or anything else. If you don't practice it, you don't get better, and you don't stay as sharp with it, you know. What about a lever? Do you ever use a lever? I can't because of my right arm. Uh, it doesn't fit into pistol grip. I can't roll my hand over so it doesn't go in there right, but... Uh, I don't have anything against them. I think they're a nice light rifle. Yep. You know, um, I, I think the pump is the best. Um, you know, the action is most reliable for that kind of hunting. Obviously, the bolt, if you get good at it, it's also really good. Automatics, if you take care of them and you got one that doesn't jam, it's not a jam-o-matic, it's an automatic, you, yep. you'd be fine with it. But as a tracker, we found out at a young age, you know, I was getting the snow and everything in there, and then I wasn't cleaning it like I should, and she'd jam. I'd have a hard time unloading it at the end of the day. Hmm. just wouldn't work. It was froze up. So the old pump, you can always drop it and get her, get her to open. Yep. <laughs> so. Yeah, you can be rough with them. Yeah, you can be rough with the pump. <clears throat> you know, obviously you should take care of your weapon, but you can be pretty rough with them and, uh, and still make them work. You know, you can put a little tape over the end of the barrel so you don't got to worry about snow going down there and getting the barrel rusted up or slipping and going in the mud or what have you, but. That's another thing on the outfit that you're going to use as a tracker. Everybody has a different, you know, body temperature, what works them up, what gets them sweaty, how cold, how warm. You just got to mess around with it to where you can walk pretty steady, not get too sweated up, and then be able to go slow for a couple hours and not freeze to death. Yeah. And you'll just sample some different things, and all of a sudden you'll have it. I don't change my outfit whether it's 20 degrees out or 35 degrees out. It's the same outfit. What are you wearing? I've got a insulated shirt. That I wear, I wear a T-shirt underneath. That's kind of the old muscle shirt, wife beater type shirt, just for because the T-shirt to me, when I get toward the end and it's getting chilly and I'm going one step at a time, seems to make the difference without that air getting to me. But a insulated shirt and then a polar fleece. Uh, they don't make them much anymore, but wool's fine as well. But just a light non-insulated coat, just something to keep the water off and. Um, you know, keep you warm when you're when you're getting close. And I know, and I, I don't know if it's uh, different now. I thought I might have heard it, but you guys snow camo a lot in uh, in the Adirondacks or white. But isn't mm -hmm. is there has that changed at all? Wasn't there a law? There's a law now that you have to wear orange. Um, I believe it's either orange vest or orange hat, one or the other. Um, when I have to, and I think uh, I always wear my my favorite hat. I had it for twenty some years, but I'll put an orange cap over it. I won't leave the hat at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a picture with me in the main buck, and I forgot I had the second hat on it. And, you know, I did a little uh, video afterwards, and you could tell I've got two <laughs> hats on. But, yeah, you do have to do it. As far as camo goes and whether the deer see the orange or not, they see the movement. You know, you can be as bright as you want or not. They see the movement. Does camo help? I think, it's, I think it helps break up the movement. You know, it's yep. that movement that they see. You know, that solidness that moves is what they're going to pick up on. Their eyesight is what's the most damning to me in, in, uh, in tracking, you know, getting by those eyes. Yeah. You know, they can hear a twig and won't go, you know, and, and, and maybe look up or whatever, and you might be able to get away with it if it's quiet for a little bit. They hear a lot of noises in the woods, you know, and, and if they smell you, there's nothing you can do. I mean, that's out of your control. But your movement, you can control. Crunchy snow. What do you do when there's when it's super crunchy, and how does your style change? The only thing that changes, I'm not a caller. I don't do the grunt call, the, the can and whatnot, 99% of the time. But on a hard crunch snow, if I'm close, I might throw that out there. Throw a little call out. Throw a little call out. But I still do the same things as far as trying to sneak up on them. I think a slow, very methodical punch into the snow, they're not going anywhere. And the other thing that people don't realize is, yeah, they got great hearing and whatnot, but I do believe in that snow, even packy snow, you can hear yourself walk, but you don't have to be that far away from you to not hear it. Um, we love windy days. They really take the sun, you know, or the, well, obviously the sun away, but also they take away the, the sound. You know, a good windy day where things are blowing around, a good snowy day. Seems pretty windy here a lot. Isn't yeah. It? Yep. Jim, yeah. Right. Jim, Jim was telling stories of, uh, you know, a couple of times in his older years where he was so close to someone coming out looking for him when he actually needed some help, but the wind. Yeah, the wind, yeah. Yeah, he couldn't hear him shoot or yell or... <laughs> Nothing, yeah, the wind will take that away from you, you know, and Jim, with more experience than, you know, I'll probably ever have. Yeah, 
the wind is, is a great, great thing when we see a windy day. I call it a killing day is when there's snow on the trees or it's snowing out, you know, with some wind. Those yeah. are definitely killing days. Um, a lot of people don't like snow on the trees. You know, they can't see as far. I like it. I think the deer can't see as far. That's mm-hmm. my thing. I'll still spot you as long as you don't spot me. Yeah. I've shot more close deer because of the snow on the trees. That's one of my favorite days. But I won't carry that scope. That scope's a nightmare on snow on the trees because every time I go under a branch, i got to clean that scope. I just won't do it. And 90% of my shots are under 50 yards anyway, so a scope isn't necessary. You know, Helps a little when you got to pick one out, but not necessary. What's the story on this buck right here? This buck I shot a couple of years ago. Um, one of the few that I shot with those, uh, there had to be one or two satellite bucks. I came into an area, and he was with the two does. And I said, I mean, great, great track. He gross scored 148. Um, big, I still Big head on him. Big head. Well, my tag terms happen to think that it was one of the bigger heads he's ever mounted in New York. Um, big old noggin on him. I actually still hunted this buck one step in him. For six hours because he had the does. My theory on the kitchen, the highway and whatnot, was out the window because he was in the house with his girls. He wasn't going anywhere. My theory on that was he's not far. Um, how, six far hours. how far did he end up being? I think I probably, from the time I picked up the track to the time I killed him, maybe three quarters of a mile. One step and three quarters One of a mile? One step and yep. three quarters of a mile. I, yep. You know what? People think that's crazy. How can you do that? When I, everybody knows somebody who can sit in a tree stand all day long. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or go three hours on oh. a platform that's 18 inches square. And you're telling me you can't get one step? Oh, the time pass. I love, I actually love doing that. Yep. And if you're one step and you know this buck is close or you're confident, it's hard to one step still hunting at random. But when you know you're on that big buck track and you know he's close, one stop, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. You know? And uh, in the end, um, a doe had gotten scared off. I'd come up on a running track that was coming toward me and then spooked off. As I was coming on his track, I seen where a deer had come down and then ran off. And I thought maybe it was one of his deer. You know, one of the two does was coming back. You know, he's doing a little chasing around. And, whatnot. and I look back to where I just made sense to me that I'm super, super close. This deer scared from me means she was here he's got to be right right behind her with the other doe or something and just all day i had confidence but my confidence level had come up and he's a perfect example that i learned from the 2019 season too i came to a little valley in the ridge that was probably only 50 yards across but it was pretty thick and it went right back up and i just happened to be standing there looking for him all of a sudden he stepped into view i go there he is right there pulled up shot and it was over he was gone yeah I don't mean it was over, I killed him. I mean, it was over, he was gone. And I actually said, did that just happen? <laughs> it happened so fast. It was like somebody yelled, pull, and you shot, and it was over. And I said, did I hit that buck? I might have. I think I did. I don't know. And so not knowing for sure, I said, well, let me try a little call. I actually pulled my grunt call out, flipped my can. Don't really believe in him that much, but I'm going to wait a little bit right here. If I... Eat, at this point, he might have thought it was just thunder, tree fell. He doesn't know what happened. If I didn't hit him, he doesn't know. I stood there for about 10 minutes, and I said, well, might as well ease my way up there and see just what's what. He had actually only taken one bound from there and was there on the ground dead. <laughs> so I obviously made the shot. Yeah. Um, actually, he wasn't dead. He couldn't go, but I, I finished him right there. And I believe it was his left side, which or I, I'm let me think for a second. Yeah, his left side was down in the snow. And I says, well, if his other side, you like know, that. if it looks like that, I'm all right. And I picked him up. And he, he actually has 12 scorable points, but I call him an 11-pointer. You know, it's just a great buck. Yeah, awesome buck. Yeah. That's your biggest scoring Adirondack buck? Yeah, pretty much the biggest gross scoring. You got a lot of them that are close, but he was he was number one. Um, but, again, what a fun hunt. Yeah. I, I don't want to – the other thing I want to clear up, too, is – if. Us as trackers, at least me personally, I've got nothing against tree stand hunting. I'll do it again. Someday when I have more time, I'll do it again. Will I still hunt on leaves? Absolutely, because I love the woods. When I have time, great, great experience. I know some guys that that love to hunt on the leaves. I'm going to do it again. The only thing I do encourage is when the snow hits, try this. Yeah. Yeah. Don't give up any of the other stuff. And another thing is this isn't a buddy hunt. This isn't where you have somebody else in your truck and you go up north and you tell them I'll meet you on the ridge or I'll see you at the truck at dark. You don't know what's going to happen that day. 
you know, you might blow it at three o'clock, go back to your truck and leave. You might hunt till dark and not come out till eight o'clock. You don't want to worry about somebody else at your pickup. You want yep. to know where your pickup is. You want to know that I, I just believe it's a solo deal. Yeah. You know, it's you and that buck. That's it. And you can go back to camp with somebody, right? Yeah. Oh, go yeah. Go back to camp. camp. Camp is great. You know, and. I want to talk about camp atmosphere a little bit, but um, but you just brought it up. Um, and I'm remembering you were pretty much a stand hunter for your younger part of your life, yeah. right? Before you got shot that one tracking. Yep. So w- let's talk about your evolution as a hunter a little bit, and what what things did you learn, and how did you how have you changed as a hunter? Well, when we were coming up through the ranks, and we started young. Um, and for people, I mean. It, huge dairy farmer you yeah. guys have what 500 head of cattle yeah well we've got 1500 but we're milking 600 1500 yeah. head of cattle yeah. and if you're in this you know there's there's farm and ag everywhere here this is my first yeah. time really to this part of the the state but there's just tons of ag mm-hmm. so you know guys that might be watching this who have never tracked or you know they there's going to be guys from the midwest watching this and and all the way out to the west and you know they're going to say you have all this agriculture around and you go there. you choose to go into the most vast wilderness where populations are lower and 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 hunt that way so let's just talk about growing well, what up was, on the farm and yeah and i'd see these other guys with some big bucks and there were trackers and of course the benoits had you know read the book the first one from larry and started to hear more about jim and I was hunting on the agriculture land and, and not getting a lot of time to hunt as, as we don't, um, shooting smaller bucks. And I wanted to get to that bigger, I wanted to get to those six-year-olds. And what we did was starting out is we'd sit in the tree stand for a couple, three hours, try to make the three hour, even in the Adirondacks, the end of the three hours, me and my brother and my father would get together, maybe do a drive or two, you know, in the big woods, which is near impossible, but hey, we'll swing up around the creek and you come on up through and we killed a few bucks that way and then sit at night. And every once in a while during that day, you'd see a huge track. Yeah. Oh, boy, ah, that's a dandy. It's pretty fresh. And then you'd go sit in your stand hoping he'd come by. Yeah. And as I got a little bit older in my late teens, that just didn't seem to make sense because he was never coming by. You know, we shot a few good ones, but it was more luck, you know, or th- that he came by your stand. You put the stand in the right area, and that was strategic. But, you know, the idea that the luck would come. I wanted to create a little more of my own luck. And... On the agriculture hunting, as you mentioned, yeah, I got all this land down here to hunt and whatnot, but I can remember uh, sitting in a tree stand in here in the school bus, hearing the dogs bark, um, wondering if George on the other farm had shot my buck last night or, you know, the last <laughs> evening or if it got killed on the highway. And that was discouraging. My patience was going thin, and then I just said, I got I to gotta see new ground and I got to try tracking. And when I killed that buck, the first one when I was 23, um, I was addicted because that was the biggest buck that I'd killed to that date. And it happened quick. I loved being on the move. I get cold easy. I wasn't cold. I didn't have to force myself to sit there. It just worked for me. And from then on, there was no more trees. And you had known about Jim Massett, read about him. and who, who like So he was obviously an inspiration to you, right? And- right. Well, I got I to gotta give kudos to my brother and father. We on the farm, one of the things is we, the word can't doesn't come into the dictionary. So if you tell me I can't track a buck, I can't this, I can't, don't tell me I can't because then I'm going to. Yeah. And our dedication to it, that we can do it, we can get it done, has always been, no matter what it was, at work or whatever. Um, my dad killed a lot of big bucks in the Adirondacks. He was a tree stand guy, very dedicated to it, knew where to put him, my brother as well. Um, I just wanted to see new ground. One of, the, one of the reasons I think that it happened is if me, my dad, and my brother were walking single file, my dad was first, my brother, then me. My brother's a little bit a uh, uh, year older than I am. So my dad would point out the track. My brother then pointed to me, and then I got to see it. And to me, that was like old by that time. I didn't get to see it first. Yeah, you know, yeah. They see a big rub up ahead of me five, ten yards, and now I get to see it. It's old news. Yeah. So I wanted to be the first one there. And a really quick side note story is one time we were going to put on a drive. I think I was 14 or 15 at the time, and maybe 16. I don't remember. And my dad said, you want to sit on this side of the creek or the other side? And the only reason I picked the other side was because then I get to see whatever's going on first. Yeah. I get to walk in the lead. My brother was going to drive the crick up. So my dad goes over in what we call Johnny's Perch. He went over and sat there. I went over and sat on a log. And doesn't the buck come running up to me? 
he come running by. I missed him on the first shot. He turned and ran right at me, and I shot right up his brisket. And there was something about being the first one in and being where nobody had been. In with track, and that's who you are. Mm. If you want to go places where you think there's old bucks and nobody's been in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and there could be great bucks, this is the way to do it. Yeah. You know, and you don't have to waste any time. You don't have to go scout it. You don't have to take time away from the family, from the business, from all that to do it ahead of time. Do it on the day the gun's in your hand. That's what's so exciting about it. Yep. You know, if, if you told me we were going to hunt in Vermont, on the second week in November, and we're going to this mountain range, and there's going to be snow. I'm already ready. Yeah. I don't have to go scout or nothing. I'm ready. Yeah. I'll pull out a map, know what direction I'm going in. I'm good. Let me go. You know, and my chances there are as good as anywhere else in the Adirond, whatever. Yeah. You know, same with Maine. Yeah. It's universal. You can do it anywhere there's big woods. You know, and that's what kind of got me excited about tracking. And in the Adirondacks, there's, got, there's so many deer that have to die of old age without a hunter ever seeing them. Oh, yeah. Most of them. And giants, you know, has, yeah. there's, there's got to be just, yeah. uh, and that, that just that. It's just like, that in itself. It's like yeah. when, you know, I'm a, I fish Lake Champlain sometimes, and I'm sure ocean fishermen have this type, you know, you just don't know. But down there, there's monster. Yeah. Whatever the world record is, there's one that's bigger than that down that you can't see. You can't see. And that's the feeling you get when you're in some place yeah. like the Adirondacks, you know? Yep. Yep. The Adirondacks isn't like Kansas and Illinois and places where they're, you know, shooting Boone and Crockett's and whatnot, but there are big, heavy bucks. We, and maybe it's because we're Adirondack hunters, but I'm sure the main hunters, Vermont hunters, all go along with that. We'd rather shoot a 120 or 130 inch buck in our area, you know, the hard way in the big woods than a 160 out there that somebody about to put us in the stand. Yep. There's something about the reward of it. It's just as powerful, just as good. And, and, you know, we love that part of it. Yeah. And, yeah, the, a bit of the intrigue of doing it is the unknown. Like you said, you don't know what's out there. You don't know, you know how big is this buck and whatnot. And you know he's there because there's nowhere in the Adirondacks there's not a big buck. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, in the beginning, like I said, I, one of the first things is you have a hard time finding that big track. It's probably because you're not looking for the track alone. You're looking for deer. You're looking for good areas. There's not many days I'm not on a big track. It happens, but it's rare. It's because when I go in the woods, if you see me walking, you'd say, that guy's never going to kill a deer. My head's down, I'm just moving. You don't have to sneak up on a track. You don't have to be quiet. You just got to go. Yeah. So The track's not going to pick you off. It's, right. Yeah. It's not going to pick you off. It's not going to wind you. It's not going to see you. It's not going to run away. All you got to do is go find it. How so, many miles is your average day tracking, if you had to think? You'd just take a guess. Well, I would say on a day that's rare, like I said, that I don't find a track, I'll probably do a 10-mile day. Will I ever be more than three miles from my truck? Probably not. You know, I'll go in for a couple of miles, maybe two and a half, and then I'll swing. There's mm -hmm. no need to go any farther. It's just as new a ground to me, left or right, as deeper in. Yeah. Um, on a track, depends on the deer. Like him, less than a mile. Most of them, I'd say the, the average day is four to five miles, which might sound like a lot to some, might not sound like much to others. But most people, on an average walk, will walk a mile an hour. Mm -hmm. So... Four hours, you're going to go four miles. You're going to find the track. You might go another mile, and now game's on. It's a five-mile day, you know, and that four miles isn't directly away from your truck. Yeah. It might be only be a mile in or, or a mile and a half in, which is only an hour or two, and then you're swinging, you know, and, and it's 11 o'clock or whatnot. You're not getting farther from your truck. You're just back down. I can never remember overworking. I work the hardest on the day I can't find the track, and that's just because my desire for that track is so, yeah. you know, in but, that's good to hear too, because I think uh, one of the a main thing that holds a lot of people f away from trying it is they think that it's you know ten to fifteen miles most of the time, and it's up and down ridges, and it's a lot of. And you got to be Iron and, Man to do it. Yeah, yeah. And it is sometimes like when I, I went and filmed Neil Pendleton on on Hal's Big West Bucks team, and I filmed him a couple years ago, and that was the first. You know, I before that I'd probably only ever walked seven miles in a day in the woods. Mm -hmm. Um, and we did, I think 14.8 or 15.8 or something like yeah. that, that day. And he's in shape, long legs, and he was booking it through there. And I was sucking pond water. You know, <laughs> yeah. I was, this I, guy's going to kill me in here. Yeah. Life. Like yeah. I, around seven miles. Like I was like, I don't know if I can keep, you know, my legs are giving out where I remember we we're going up this long, long ridge. And I'm like, I just, I don't know. My legs are giving out. I got to you know, slow down a little bit or something. He was like, all right, all right. So just, I took my time to get up that hill. Once I got to the top. I had a second wind, and that the next seven miles were 
or yeah. like a piece of cake almost yeah. and extended my range and now i know like look i can do a 14 mile day no problem yeah. that's not going to be a problem yeah i don't but, even know if but I've you don't have to one. yeah no 12 miles i think was my most 12 13 miles on a gps and you know obviously i wasn't that far from the truck you know 13 miles from the truck is it and you know being in better shape probably does give you an advantage on some days when you can't find a track but it's it's not that necessary i mean you can do a slower pace you might not find the track five out of ten days or seven out of ten days where i'll find it nine out of ten days and you'll might find it every time but uh you will find it in a good portion of the time you know it's within the first mile or two and you're right for there's something about that first you know once you get over that first ridge and get in there first you get you catch a second wind you're you're in your stride and you're just but don't burn yourself out. No. Don't rush in there thinking you got it. And at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you're winded out. Yeah. Just take it slow. You'll be amazed at a nice, slow pace how much ground you'll cover in a day. And not wear yourself out. Now, Neil, as you said, probably long late, moves fast. When it, you don't have to go that fast. A mile an hour. He was low. We were looking for trend. We didn't find many good ones that, right. you know, there was in a place in Massachusetts where you, we did get on one good one, but it ran into a posted sign, which sucks. Yeah. So then we were just like, all right, we got to get all the way out. We're going away from the posted sign. Let's go find another one. So we were just searching all day. It wasn't right. like we were really in the game that much. Right. Those are the worst days. It's going to happen. <clears throat> you know, you're going to sit in tree stands and not see deer. You know, it's going to happen in the track and thing. But there are going to be days you're driving back into the area you want to hunt and one cross the road. Game on. Here we go. You know, you don't even have to go anywhere. And there is something about it. It's a strange thing. But when you find a track, you do get a second, third, and fourth win. Yeah. All of a sudden, now you're not tired. You're not anything, you know, yep. game's on. Yeah. You know, and you're closing the gap. That buck's in front of you. The George didn't kill it. The school bus, you know, the 10-wheeler last night. That buck's alive and just out of you. Let's go. Let's go take a look. You when know. you get, when you kill your bucks now out there, and you know Jim. Jim was famous for carrying them out. What do you do? Are you dragging? You carry ever? What are you doing with? No, your I have carried a few, but you know, uh, on snow it's much easier to drag. You know, the carrying days were more for when it was leaf. You know, yep. leaves on the ground. Yep. Um, what I do is I just I always have a dragging rope, kind of the Benoit thing. Everybody, you know, a lot of trackers do it. Tie a rope around the antlers, tie it around a good solid stick. You yep. know, put yep. it behind you and start pulling. Um, I'll drag until. Physically, I can't drag anymore. In other words, if I know my back's a little sore, I'm out of gas. And I don't care if I start at 2 in the afternoon or if I start right at dark. I'll still drag. Mm -hmm. And people think, well, that's a lot of work going on. What would you rather be doing in November than dragging out your big buck? Yeah. You know, that's part of the part of the enjoyment. I mean, and, you know, you can say a mile, two miles, it's, you know, you got to drag it out, three miles, whatever it is. You don't have to do it in one pull. You know, you you don't have to go more than ten or fifteen yards in one pull. Yeah. Take a break and then pull again. You'd be amazed how far you get. You know, just and then when it gets to be too much, mark the spot. You know, you're gonna have some buddies that want to come the next say, day and help you. Help, yeah. Yeah, you're gonna come back in there and slowly, you know, bring them right out. And a lot of people wonder about the coyotes, and it's a strange thing with me. Um, every time one of my friends are, you know, wound a buck, and don't get them, gut them, and drag them, the coyotes find them. I've left 25% of my bucks in the woods overnight. I've never had them bother a buck. And I've had coyotes cross within 100 yards of them. And the fact is, um, this buck right here, I, I shot him, uh, dragged till a little after dark, half an hour, 45 minutes after dark. I ran out of gas myself. I left him. The next day, a buddy of mine uh, came back in with me to get him out, and I was walking up an old logging road, and I was probably 150 yards, and there's coyote tracks. Yeah. And I thought, oh, they got him. It's over. I got to him, and he was fine. Hmm. They never went to him. I don't know why. I don't understand it. I don't know if I can. I do place a couple of shells out so they'd smell the metal and think there were traps. But I've never had him even investigate. Interesting. So That looks like a nice old older buck. Yeah, he was actually seven and a half. <clears throat> um, I tracked him. He, he, that's another. I, I said it earlier, but he fooled me. I thought I was in the kitchen. He was feeding when we got out, we went out on the very top of the ridge, went fed probably for 100 yards. I wasted two and a half hours up there, and all of a sudden he went off the ridge. I go, well, you're not here now because <laughs> he's going downhill hard. I mean, it was really steep. I go, well, what the heck? I tracked him along the bottom of the ridge going back just kind of on the highway. He wasn't stopping or anything. I said, well, I wasted two hours, but it's okay. I'm still in the game. Yeah. You know, I'd rather do that than spook him. Yeah. Went back, 
And he's now climbing back up on in an area where I got to grab branches to go up. It was one of those dirt runs that go up a side of a hill that the, you know, the deer had used. There was probably three to four inches of snow. And as I got to the top, I stepped over and he come out of his bed right in front of me. He was right at the top. There. Right at the top, 20 yards in. He couldn't even see down that steep part. Mm -hmm. But he seen me just as I come over. I might have taken two, two steps and there he goes out of his bed. I throw the gun up and I fire at him. And I realized there's a huge bull. As I was coming up, I could see this huge bull to my right just before I got to where he was. So after I shot, I ran to the edge of the woods or to the edge of the, the, to the bank where I'd just come up only 20 yards down. And I looked this huge bull over and I looked down and I pulled the longest shot I've ever shot at a whitetail. <laughs> he ran around that whole edge. Scoped or beat? Came down. I was scoped. Yeah. He came all the way around that edge and stopped below me. I don't know exactly. Someday I'm going to go back there, but I'll bet you it was 200 yards. Now, yeah. how often can you see 200 yards in the woods? Yeah. <laughs> he, looked, he looked tiny down there. Yeah. And uh, pulled up and shot him. I never touched Did him. Did he drop right? Shot. Oh, no. He dropped right there, and yeah. I didn't know it. I saw him there after I shot, and I go, he's right. He doesn't even know he's getting shot at. And I shot again, and I saw his head flip back. What I didn't know is I'd put him down with that second shot, and the third one was just putting in him, but he, he was just struck, you know, passing away right there. Hmm. So I walked around, and there he was. Awesome. Yeah, it was a great, great uh, thing. Yeah, it was, it was really rewarding, Buck, you know. So. No, one, one really interesting thing um, when I was talking with Jim yesterday was, um, you know, the remote camps, and he would go out and set, you know, his dad would pick out a spot, and they'd build a, a remote tent camp and might be six miles from the road and then they'd hunt six miles out sometimes so you're 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 in there deep but i wanted to know what his culture was like in there what it was like you know they'd have i think six guys he said would be in there a lot and what was it like you know in deer camp at night what were you guys come back who cooked what was going on did you play cards he said you know <laughs> they're boozers so when they would get in there and the first night you know they might have a have a drink but they'd be, they'd go they'd are in there at midnight get there in midnight right they go to bed and then when they come back, they hunt all, they hunt, they're, they're serious, right? They're in their hunt to hunt. And they'd hunt all day, come back Saturday. There wasn't any card playing or anything. They would eat. They might have one drink. They'd pat, they'd go to bed. Yep. You know, that it was, and I, I like that because they're, they are taking it, they're out there to hunt. They're taking it seriously. You know, yep. you could fall into a trap of staying up all night and then you're literally just going out to that remote camp <laughs> yeah. to party. And that's. So what is it like with uh, in, in your camp? What do you what what's camp like at night? Well, with me now, of course, I hunt a lot with Steve Grabowski. He I've been hunting with him now for twenty years. He's uh, you know he he loves to do the same thing, and my good friend Steve from down in the city, he comes up anytime there's snow, and our thing is a lot like Jim's. Yeah, we all like to have a drink or two. Um, we tell stories, we laugh, and it, it's and we wrote a book, and it's you know, Adirondack stories as told in deer camp. And yep. that's what the book is about. When you walk back into camp, everybody's got a story. You know, if you, as a tracker, something happened that day. Mm -hmm. you, you know, whether you fell in the creek or you saw the big buck or you missed them or something went on that day. So there's a lot of storytelling and there's a lot of, you know, we're breaking each other's chops and it's just a lot of fun. But um it is amazing how late it gets how quick so you got to yeah. get to bed you got to get some rest you yeah. know and the next day it's all everybody in the morning is you know hey get your gear ready we're going it's excitement that's another thing about track and um if you think about the tree stand guy <clears throat> like i said i'm not taking anything away from him but at the three hour mark he's looking at his watch i can make it another half an hour i think i can you know in the days shot you know for the morning then he gets down he goes out he gets lunch or whatever and the guy who's going to go all day kind of lost that excitement of the first part of the day that breaking daylight one when he's really excited about it and now he's just i hope some deer come by you mm -hmm. know and he's he might be looking at his phone and at the day just to me is at least to me isn't near as exciting think about my day <clears throat> i leave the truck i'm going after a new track and i'm on this great hardwood ridge i'm seeing rubs or a scrape or whatever it's 10 o'clock i'm warm I'm just getting in the area I want to hunt. I'm deep in. I'm thinking, how, when's the last time anybody's been in here? Yeah. Seeing a big rub here and there. Now it's 1130 and I come across a huge track. My day has just spiked up again. I'm on a big track and I'm following him. It's one o'clock. We're on the highway and all of a sudden he's off the highway and I'm in the game. Mm -hmm. Compared to sitting in that tree stand all day, 
I don't know. Yeah. I don't think there's a competitor. There's, there's a constant building of excitement. Yes, and it's all day long. Yeah. You know, the love of the game is all day long. Now, even if I didn't find a track, I found big rubs. I saw some big scrapes. I saw an old track that was too old to take. Uh, I found a great open hardwood. I found some old signpost rubs. Something I found that day. And as you said, when you get back to camp, that's just makes it up. One of the greatest uh, contributions that Jim ever made to my hunting uh, lifetime of achievement was he taught me that it's us against the deer, not me against you. You know, he taught me to be happy for the other hunter. And it's made such a difference on how I view hunting, how I view other hunters, how I view their stories, how I view their bucks and whatnot. I'm as happy for them as I am for myself. And that was because of his unselfish, want everybody to win. We're out there to get the bucks. Doesn't matter who gets them. And if you've been in Jim's trophy room, you know, He's honestly shot more than his share. You know, he, he's he's a great hunter, and he he uh, he's so happy for the other guy. It's an incredible experience to see, and he taught me that at a young age. So before you met him, what were your what were you like as a hunter? Well, before I met him, um, it was kind of like keep your buck a secret. You know that you that you know is there. Uh, hope that you get him. A little territorial, a little maybe. territorial, a little jealous of the other guy. Um, didn't like that he got a buck and it might have been, and I want to degrade his buck and whatnot. And then I realized I'm going to shoot a good buck one day, I hope. And I hope that guy's happy for me. So why wouldn't I want to be happy for him? You know what I mean? And Steve Grabowski's that way. He's always happy to see me shoot a big buck, um, or at least he seems to be. <laughs> and I'm happy when he, and this year Steve happened to shoot a buck bigger than any mine will ever be. It was in the 160s in the Adirondacks. Giant buck tremendous giant buck and he, he couldn't get me there fast enough to share in the joy and he knew i was i'd be happy for him and as a matter of fact when i first bent down to the buck and i picked it up and i looked those horns over and it was a tremendous buck i said steve you know what's wrong with this buck and he goes what i go nothing <laughs> i go he's got height he's got width he's got mass he's just what a symmetry Every part of that yeah. buck was great. If you could draw a picture of a 10-pointer that you want to shoot on any given year. And anywhere without, in any, the country, too. Anywhere yeah. in the country and not getting crazy, <clears throat> this buck's a little bigger than that buck you drew. You know, yeah. he's just a great, great buck. Yeah. And Jim taught me to be happy for that guy. And it's made a – you go into camp, Jim does most of the work. He cooks for everybody. He wants to do the, the dishes. He wants everybody to get out there and hunt. You know, he, he could – um, mess up on a 10-pointer on Governor's Brook that's 20 inches wide, come back to camp full of six guys and tell them exactly where he left it. You guys go get him. Yeah. yeah. Who wants to go get that buck one now? Now, if the guys in the camp, most of them are, none of them are going to touch it because they want Jim to get it. Yeah. Rightfully so. He was the one who was on it. But Jim would want someone else to get it. Yeah. You know, or at least as much as he wants to. It's just that kind of unselfishness is, you know, priceless. As Steve said at dinner last night, too, he's, he's a – He's a fisherman that hunts. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Steve and he's a, a great hunter too, but he, yeah. he he loves his fishing. He loves his fishing. The man will go fishing by himself if no one wants to go with him, and he'll catch fish. He <laughs> knows fishing, but he likes to hunt as well. Yeah, you know. But uh, great fisherman. And, and Steve from down in the city, he uh, he's become a great tracker these days. Uh, a couple of years ago, he had missed three bucks. Now this guy is a crack shot. Um, I was hunting one time in Maine with him, and we had muzzle loaders, and we decided we should shoot these. It's been a couple of wet days, so we put a, a size of a Clorox jug, not even it was a Drano jug. It wasn't even as big as a Clorox jug. Up at 60 yards, we're just going to shoot at. So I said to Steve Feinberg, I says, "Hey, why don't you use the corner of my tailgate there to rest the gun?" He said, "No, I'm all right." So I said, "All right," I saw I'll shoot. So I laid it on the corner of my gun. Of course, I missed the jug. Steve then steps up offhand, rests there for a minute or so, and puts a hole more or less center mass of the, and now I got to shoot again yeah. off a rest. And I prayed, and I was lucky enough to hit the jug. <laughs> Tremendous shot. But a um, few years later, we're doing a lot of tracking, and this tracking thing takes a while, and Steve has a season where he misses three good bucks. And in my mind, you know, he needed to shoot quicker. But... He sealed the deal because he shot the fourth one and got it. Yeah. So through the thing, I said, that Steve's got to get to shoot quicker. He's got to practice those quick shots. And then he gets the buck. Now, to see four big bucks in the Adirondacks in the same year tracking, mm. 
it just tells me Steve's got it. Yeah. Steve has figured this out. He knows how to do it. He he he's going to have great seasons come. As, isn't that so fun to mentor somebody too and get them up to speed on you know just well, get I, them. I, I wouldn't say I mentored him, other than he might have changed a little bit of of hunting, uh, a little different style. Um, now he'll hunt right till dark. He was coming out. In fact, because yeah. I think he enjoys it. Sometimes I pick him up two or three miles from his truck, and it's two hours after dark, and. His ability to stay with that buck, have the confidence and whatnot. Maybe it's because he's hanging, you know, we're together, you know, at camp and whatnot. But whatever happened to him, he's he's got it now. Yeah, yeah. I've I've got a hundred percent confidence that he's going to get it happening every season. You know, he's going to get his chances. He's going to do it right. Yep. You know, um, if he picked up something from what I said, great. Or if he learned it on his own, great. But he's got it. Yeah. He's got it. Yeah. You know, and Steve Grabowski's the same way. Um, Steve has a little trouble with his back, Grabowski, and uh, doesn't probably travel as far. And he, he claims it might have made him a better hunter. Slowed down a little bit to a, to a buck or, you know, I, I really don't know. But uh, Lanny talks about that now, too, as he, you know, in the older ages of tracking, you know, he's might only go a mile and a half, but he get, he, he can kill a buck within a mile of the truck most of the time, you know. Yeah. You just you yeah. slow down and you're not ranging as far as you were before, but. Um, it makes you go slower, and you get other opportunities that way. It's just sure evolving. Sure. I think the biggest holdback as you get older and you can't travel quite as far as finding the track, you know, that might be a little bit more of a holdback. I know in Maine they've got a lot of roads that they can travel and, and, and find a good buck, and some of them do go a long ways. And I mean, I've hunted with Hellblood a few times. I've been his cameraman a few times, and, you know, I don't know many guys who can travel as far as he can, and I know he'd probably say at his age it's, Starting to get a few less miles, but boy, he can travel. And his dedication to it is, you know, he's he's got me beaten that one. When he's on a track, man, that deer is in serious trouble because he has got the dedication. He's living in the woods. I mean, he's yeah. in it. His experience in the <clears throat> woods has got to be some of the best, you know, most vast and knowledgeable because he, he guided for years. And yeah. it didn't matter the conditions. Yep. You were out on dry leaves. You were out on wet leaves. You were out on deep snow, crunchy snow, no snow. You, you did it all. You know, where me, I'm I'm a snow guy. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying I couldn't hunt on leaves. I'd enjoy it. Well, and you're up. a farmer during the day, too. Yeah, so, so you know, I, you know. He lives and he's living in the woods. Everything. Yeah. That's his job. That was his job. So yep. the, the different things that he's seen over the years is incredible. got to be crazy good, yeah. But like I said, Steve Feinberg's got it now. Steve Grabowski's got it. We, you know, we, we go in. We we don't hunt with each other. We, we don't ride. It. If we're going even in the same area, everybody's in their own truck. You know, it's just the way it is. You don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know what you're going to do. And one example I got of this is I uh, I went into an area that we've got a camp, and I stopped short of it maybe seven, eight miles. And I dropped down in this area I'd never been before, and I was going to go in there and hunt, and there was probably an inch of snow. Well, I got down in there in the lower parts, and, you know, the snow was three-quarters of an inch. And I go, you know, back in toward camp, I go, there's more. It's higher elevation. There might be more snow. I'm going to get out of here. Book back out to my truck. Now, think about if there was two of you and you just let the other guy off. Now, yeah. all of a sudden, you took the truck away. Yeah. If he gets cold or something, he's got to come out to it. He doesn't have a vehicle. So I'm alone, which, mm -hmm. you know, kind of puts a point to being alone and not hunting with anyone. Well, anyway, I drove up the road six or seven miles, and sure enough, there's two and a half inches of snow. Got out of my truck. It's probably 1030 at this point. Walked 500 yards into the woods and cut a buck track. Started following the track, and he's feeding. <laughs> I said, this is just... I mean, I, what are the chances that I left another area, came in here, and, and it worked? I, uh, I tracked him for about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever it was, and the buck jumped up from behind a blowdown and ran directly away from me, and I could hear him going how close he was, and there was a little crunch to the snow, and then he veered and went right across in front of me at about 60 yards, open hardwoods, and I shot twice at him, and I thought to myself, did I just hit that running buck? This was years ago. And <clears throat> at the, after the second shot, I'm thinking, did I hit him? And I took a step, and I looked up through it, and I could see the deer standing. So I know he's hit. I know he's wobbly when I, I shot again, and he disappeared. And sure enough, I, had, I went over to the first shot, and there was a spray of hair. And I said, you know, and then the blood started. So I knew I'd hit him. I was probably more excited that I actually hit a running deer at that point than <laughs> yeah. anything. But to, uh, to round this story out, when I shot the last shot, I took my sling, sling out of my pocket and I set it down. And I reached in my pocket, grabbed my other clip, and reloaded my gun. 
I left the sling there because I knew I was going to come back and take some pictures for the slide film that we were doing in those presentations back then. And <clears throat> went up, saw the deer, said, well, let me go back down and see what he was doing before I jumped him. So I came back down to where the blowdown was and realized he was laying right behind it. And I came around the corner and there was a guy picking my sling up out of the snow. <laughs> and it startled me. I said, who are you? And he, and he, he looked at me and he said, um, did you get him? He didn't answer who he was. He said, did you get him? And I said, yeah. He said, son of a gun. He says, I've been on that buck since daylight. <laughs> I didn't realize yeah. I'd cut him off, yeah. obviously, at 1030. Yeah. And he said, the guys back at camp, you know, told me I couldn't shoot a buck in the Adirondacks. And I told him I was going to come to find out he shot a buck that scored 170 in Montana that year. Yeah. And he had come up there. And I said to him, I said, uh, hey, I said, what kind of gun is that? Because it was a green and brown camo. I said, that's kind of a neat looking gun. He said, well, it's a yada, yada, yada uh, uh, stock. I don't remember what he said, but it's a Hart's Barrel. From Hart's Barrel. Oh, yeah. Telling me Hart's. And, he, and I said, oh, that's nice. He said, and by the way, I'm Jimmy Hart. And he <laughs> shook my hand. I said, no kidding. So he said, do you need help getting him out? Well, like I said, I'd only come in 500 yards and whatnot. I said, no. And he went up and looked at the buck and whatnot. And obviously, I felt bad that I'd cut him off, unbeknownst to me. Um, fast forward to the show out at in Syracuse. I seen Jimmy, and I believe it was his uncle, at the show. And I was talking to Lanny Benoit. And I introduced the two. They got talking, and to the, that's how Hart Sparrow got on the Benoit. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Cool story. Kind of neat. Oh. Fast forward five years, I've got my son with me, and we made a big loop in that area. And we popped out on the road five miles down from where my truck is. My son is a little bit younger at that point, and he's, he's gassed out. I'm tired. We're both tired, and we're walking up the road. Here comes a pickup truck. What are the chances they're going to pick up two guys with a gun? But it is a dead end road. Might be a hunter, might not. So I just happened to throw out the old hitchhike sign and they stopped. And I said, is there any chance we could jump on your tailgate and you give us a ride up to our truck? It's an old dirt road. And he said, it's up at the, you know, where the gates are. He said, sure. I said, God, you look familiar. He goes, I oughta. You shot a buck in front of me five years ago. It was Jimmy Hart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hadn't seen him since that like, five years earlier. That's awesome. So kind of a neat story. I was going to ask you if you knew Bobby Hart. Last night it was, I was going to bring it up at dinner because I met him uh, at um, Springfield Sportsman Show this year. And he's in that he's in that family. I know somebody owns the gun business. Somebody owns the the barrels, I believe. Yeah, I yeah. forget how it goes. But Bobby was a, he was a great guy. Did you ever meet him? I don't think so. Yeah. I might have at that show, but that, this is years ago. He did ago. bring up the, uh, the, how the Benoit, he brought that story up that you told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. It was, <laughs> yeah. That, was, that was something, that, you know, just to have it happen and then to bump into him again. I don't like cutting anybody off, and I hate the fact of being cut off. Yeah. You well, know, when you're tracking, but it doesn't happen much in the Adirondacks. Yep. You know? I, um, I did do it in Maine once to a guy, and I, I felt terrible because of the circumstances. Uh, you know, I, I picked up the buck track and it was muzzleloader season and I went to the top of the hill. Long story cut short. I was looking for that buck to make the mistake. I was, I'd been sneaking on him for an hour and a half. I know he's right there. He's feeding. It's late season. He's right there. And I must have stood there for five minutes knowing that buck is right there. And I happened to look hard over my left shoulder at the one more step. And the buck is looking right at me. And I know he's been watching me. I, I, I'm right there in the open. I know he's been watching me. As I look at him, I ease. I go, will he let me get the shot off? And as I ease the gun up, he bolts. Mm -hmm. He goes back down to the road where I picked him up. And I see a guy's track had come out to the road. Yeah. And I said, I cut that guy off. Yeah. He went down his back track <clears throat> 20 yards before the road and rubbed a 12-inch tree. <laughs> and, I, and I took a picture of that and I said, this poor hunter. He's on a buck that just rubbed a 12-inch tree, pops up to the road 20 yards later, and some yeah. guy took it. But that's him. just, that's, you, you, there's no way to tell that you're cutting somebody no off. No way to tell. Yeah. No way to tell. But I wish I would have left that buck at that junction because he went down in there another 100 yards and got in a creek, and he went 100 yards upstream and come back out. I said, this buck's been followed many yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah, and I never saw the buck again. Yeah. He's one of those bucks that just said, game's on. Forget yeah. about it, buddy. Yeah. You're not going to see me. You don't hunt Maine all too often, do you? No, 
No, uh, you know, once in a while we get the occasion to do it, but I, I shot this this buck behind you that he weighed 221. Yeah, I don't know if people see can see that, so I'm gonna move it so they can look at it. Yeah, he weighed 221. I was up there for a few days and and it started raining one day and it was raining so hard you had to turn the windshield wipers on high. And I was driving around looking for a track. It got to be about nine o'clock. I said, I gotta get in the woods. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> I came across the doe and a fawn track yeah. and I said, well, this is as good a place to go in as any. I'm just going in. I stepped out of my truck for, I'll bet you 30 seconds. And I said, this is crazy. It is raining as hard as it can rain on four inches of snow. The kicker part was that night it was going to go to 19. I said, it's now or never. This, this, this deer is going to, uh, or this snow is going to get so crunchy. You won't, it'd be almost impossible to hunt. Anyway, the story goes that I went in, I saw the doe fawn. And I was going to head back to the truck. My shoulders are already wet through. It was pouring out. It's 10 mm -hmm. o'clock. I said, well, I'm going to make a loop in here, maybe a mile, and then I'll go to the truck. I got to hunt. I went about 400 yards, and I come on some moose tracks, and his track was amongst the moose. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding me? A buck when it's raining like this, I've got a track. I went about half a mile on him. Just He was cruising, and he hit an old cut. When he went out in the old cot, he fed a little. And that's where I started stalking him. It was probably 37, 38 degrees, raining as hard as it can with a fog on. And I know the snow, and it, although there was five inches, wasn't going anywhere, but it was, you know, it was, it was, it was leaving, but not, it wasn't going to be gone. Yeah. It was probably 1.32 o'clock. I don't know if I've ever been more ready to kill a buck than that buck. I was in position most of the time with a gun at just waiting for somebody to say pull. Mm -hmm. There's no way this deer is going to hear me. It's raining so hard. A little bit of wind. I'm not that cold, although I'm getting cold. And I'm in a cut that's probably four or five years old, maybe six. The, the briars are about waist high with lanes and open areas yeah, that they yeah. had not come in. It's just perfect. Yeah. And this track is smoking fresh. This buck's here. You know, he's here. Long story to end, I took that next step. He went out at 16 yards out of his bed, and he ran directly away from me. I thought I shot three shots f faster at that deer than I've ever shot at a deer in my life. It was just boom, 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 and it was over. He had crashed out of sight, but right then I knew I'd killed that deer. He didn't bound away from me. He ran flat out. He was that scared. He was in that flight mode that when they get really, really scared, they go, but the target was just still just going away from me and I was I was so ready for him that goes back to that shoebox shooting at that shoebox yeah I as a young hunter would have said there he goes and he was gone as an experienced shooter now boom 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 yep you and were, then you go there he goes yeah you were prepared yeah you're yeah everything was in place and uh with everything in life if you're super super prepared then nerves aren't going to creep in you know right and I'm no good at weights so I got back to the thing, and I was with my buddy Steve uh, Feinberg, and he looked him over, and I said, I go, I don't know, he's got to be close to 200. He goes, that buck will weigh 220. Just like that, he said it. And I go, I don't know about that, you know, two, whatever. We'll get him on a scale. Wait, 221. Yeah. So wow. Steve yeah. almost hit it and yeah. nailed it on the head, and he was so confident. There wasn't even a, 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 a bit of doubt in his mind, but what a fun buck. Yeah, that's and, great. You know, and I knew the hunt was over after that because of the cold weather coming. You know, that I, I say it about uh, picking your days. If you want to try this, don't see it snow on Wednesday and say, I'll hunt on Saturday. Yeah. You've got to hunt Thursday. Yeah. You know, you can't, because Saturday it could be gone. You know, I had an experience of that when I was younger, that it snowed 15, 18 inches, and me and my dad went out of the camp, and we knew it was too much. I mean, it was up to your knees. Just too much snow. I didn't know enough to go to where the snow line got less, and we came home and said, we'll come back next weekend. We were weekend warriors then. And the next weekend, I was on patchy snow. Yeah. It was gone. Yep. And I said, never again. Yeah. I missed some great days during that week. Oh, I'm sure. You know, and I was in my early 20s then. And I said, from now on, I'm not a weekend warrior. I'm a hunting when it snows. And that's it. And I gave my father, my brother, my nephews, they all have the pass to go hunt on the farm anytime they want. You know, bow season, whatnot. I'm not hunting. I'm here at the farm. But when the snow hits, I'm going. You know, be ready for that. Yep. So, <laughs> you know. Fun way to do it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I uh, I encourage people to try it. Don't give up what you're doing, but give it a shot. Got a lot of great bucks. A lot of great bucks ahead of you. You're still young, obviously. And Jim mentioned that again. He's like, you know, 
Joe, Joe's so far ahead of where I was at this age, and he's got so much more time ahead of him. Well, I don't know about being ahead of where he was, but I can tell you this, you know, he, he, he still gets around better than 90% of the people. He slowed down a little bit this last year, but, you know, the, the love of the woods and the love of the camp he still has. Yeah. And we had talked about that last night. You know, you get into his camp, he's happy to see you and happy, to, you know, we just have a great time. Yeah. So, you know, he's got a big family coming in behind him. He's got some uh, uh, nephews that, and great nephews that are all taking up the hunting, so. Yeah. Well, you guys will be able to meet uh, Joe, Jim, Steve at um, at Huntstock. Yep. You're going to be doing a seminar every day there. You guys will have your books there that uh, we talked about earlier. Yep. Um, people yep. want to pick up a book. Uh, just shoot the hay. Bunch of great guys. Um, so August 11th through the 13th in uh, Wildwood Farm, Westminster, Mass. Going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. We uh you know, this is our first year there. I've heard a lot of good you know, a lot of good buzz going around about that outdoor show and we're 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 looking forward to it. We're gonna be there all three days. So yeah, so hopefully we'll see a bunch of guys there. Yeah, so come say hi to these guys and uh again thanks uh thanks for the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome conversation. I appreciate it. I appreciate and it. And the hospitality has been great. Oh yeah, Thank no you. worries. Yeah. No worries. Three oh eight carbine, um seven sixty. I don't know if it's ever been hunted with I picked it up a couple of years ago and I know in this market she'd be worth quite a lot oh yeah but uh, you know this is the go-to otherwise I put a peep sight on them and uh, it's not my hunting rifle but uh, it just happens to be one I grabbed out of the safe what else you got in that safe well I I picked up this from my uncle who passed away uh, last year but it's a 35 Whalen carbine it's got some notches on it where he uh, some bucks he had killed, and uh, I bought some guns from the, my aunt, the estate. She ended up giving me this one if I if I was going to hunt with it, and this is my new main gun. Uh, by that I mean the one if I go hunting up in Maine. Yeah. This is the gun I'm going to carry. Yeah. Uh, I'll change it over to a peep sight and take the scope off of it, but uh, looking forward to killing a buck with my. I see the notches gun. around there. Yeah. 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 He'd killed some bucks with it. And the wear on the other side yeah, where he's you pumping. Can, yeah. It. Yeah. He'd and he it. always bought them new or in really great shape. So, you know, this gun had seen a lot of ground, you know. So, I'm looking forward to that, you know, in, in, uh, in, the, in the near future. I'm trying to think if my. Uh, no, actually, my my uh, my gun's not in here. That I my other 760. But you know, anytime in hell blood would be one to tell you that you can take these guns and uh, full rifles, uh, long barrels, and cut them the carbines. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that we we do that, or I like doing that, is if you do happen to sling your gun and you go under a branch, the barrel goes with you. If the barrel's longer than you, a lot yeah. of times it'll catch that branch. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, that's why we cut them down. But, you know, it's all good.